Good morning and thank you everyone for being here from across the state, all 14 counties in Vermont. <clears throat> As of yesterday, over 145 people registered for this, act, this wonderful event um, and more wanted to join us. So it's an overflow registration crowd and we're delighted that you're here. We are looking, for, I'm Katina Cummings. I'm sorry about that. I should have started with that. I'm Katina Cummings, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a proud community health worker ally and I am the project director for the Vermont Community Health Worker Workforce Initiative in partnership with the Department of Health. I'm with Southern Vermont AHEC. So before we start, I just wanted to say, I think we're going to have truly a nourishing day, both, or I should say, in mind, body, and spirit. And we appreciate uh, this gathering. There are over 67 organizations represented today in this room, and 67 organizations in healthcare and in other sectors. And that's the beauty of the community health worker workforce and what will happen in the days ahead, I hope. Before we get started, I would like to ask Donna, Donna Taniati with the Abenaki of the Miskoi to come up and please give us, she has something to share with us. Thank you, Donna. Come on up. Looks like I'm way back taller. <laughs> In our culture, we do different things a little bit um, unique to probably the culture you grew up with. And we um, do a condolence concept. And for those of you who may not know what that is, I'd like to read something to you to explain what a condolence concept is. 17th and 18th century Euro Americans were always frustrated the amount of time spent by indigenous people in games like lacrosse, dancing, singing, cooking, and feasting, etc., before the council started. This was because of the practice of condolence that emotions, most importantly, negative feelings, such as frustration, anger, etc., must be addressed before business so that they are neutralized and do not appear in the business before a council or within a family. Ways of addressing this are games, sweat lodges, music, cooking the council meal together, even having enemies go together into the forest to guild game to be served to the assembly. I have taken the liberty of doing a purification of this space beforehand to encourage positivity. And with that in mind, we have done our feasting and now we are going to be able to get together and talk to each other and hopefully play games, maybe some mind games. So I'll leave you with a traditional indigenous greeting. Walk in beauty and truth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Before we get into the program, I would also, many of you understand and know that today is World AIDS Day. And there will be a commemoration that will be offered right now by Kel Arbor from the Vermont Pride Center of Burlington. Kel, please come on up. Thanks so much, y'all. Um, it's amazing to see all these folks out here today. And being at World AIDS Day, I'm really grateful. Um, thank you for such a nice opening, Donna. <sighs> this is a, a hard day for our community, not just in the US, but globally. And for me, this is the day that we extra call in racism. It's a day that we extra call in how do we as a state do better than good, do better than mediocre that we could do great, that we could be a beacon and a refuge for anybody living with HIV that needs care. Vermont does that better than 
I think any state in this country, we have medication adherence, which means people take their meds every day. If you're living with HIV like I am, I almost died with an AIDS diagnosis a decade ago, and that we have medication to save people's lives is incredible. And the disparity in access for that, for so many reasons, but poverty and racism top that list. Vermont, 92% of our Vermonters have access to medication and take it every day. That's incredible. Incredible. Yes, thank you, Vermont. And that's because of our care networks and our partnerships. We are able to hold people. We're not able to hold everybody, though. The people that can get here can get that service and access. The black and brown people that get here and feel like they can stay here can keep that access. We've learned that white guys, white gay guys have great access to PrEP, the preventative med for HIV, but it's the black and brown guys who stay on PrEP. That was an interesting thing to learn. So thinking about how we can offer up access and welcome people to our communities is about visibility. It's about days like these where people like me and others in our community stand up and say, I live with HIV. It's not a death sentence anymore for all of us, but it is for some of us still. Globally, medication access is about 56%. The places with highest impact are Sub-Saharan, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Some of those folks can refuge and get here, but not many of them. So I would love to see Vermont do better. I know that just talking about HIV and having some information about it reduces stigma, letting folks know the facts. You don't get it from toilet seats and insects. We know everything we've needed to know since 1985 about HIV. The one thing that has not changed is stigma. Dare I say stigma's gotten worse. Our lives are even more at risk. LGBTQIA folks, as a trans person, I live with great privilege passing as a white guy, passing as an oppressor. <laughs> so I want to make sure that everybody else can stay here too. So it's important that you don't see me as a cishat white guy, right? So that visibility, that encouragement, we're putting out a film today of a few local Vermonters. We did some story sharing about impacts of living with HIV, the importance of the AIDS quilt, remembering the people that we've lost we lost too many people in a short amount of time. And what they figured out at the end of the height of the crisis is that it's intersectional, it's economic, it's racial, it's gender, it's sexuality, but we're not working well together. So it's a day that I extra call in solidarity. I brought some basic HIV info, which I'll share at my table. Um, look for our film on the Pride Center website. And if you need any information about HIV, you can always reach out to us and we offer free community testing. So we love to get out there and get testing. We can test our way out of the pandemic and epidemic that HIV still is. And now is a great time to work better together. So thanks so much, y'all. Thank you, Cal, and thank you again, Donna. I am so honored to be in the presence of all of you and especially these two leaders and others in the room. So you see that the promise and power of community health workers in Vermont is our theme for today, paving a path to equity. Most of you know that community health workers are a unique community-based public health workforce, which for many, Many of you, maybe you're just discovering that, and for others, you're rediscovering it. We have a mix in this room of organizations that employ community health workers, that are interested in employing and learning more about community health workers, and some who have been doing it for many, many years have been running CHW programs. So there is so much today to learn from each other, and we hope this will be a, a networking and learning uh, event for you. This is certainly a pivotal moment in our state, <clears throat> as it is around the country, in recognizing persistent inequities in healthcare and structures, our structures, not just medical, that require new approaches to build a more equitable and just society. And many of you 
are the answers, are the solutions to these challenges. As I mentioned earlier, community health workers are a local public health based workforce. They are patient centered. They reduce chronic disease disparities in low income and minority and underserved communities, and they're cost effective. An Institute of Medicine paper in 2015 demonstrated that CHWs are so effective, and the history is long in the United States, not so long in Vermont yet, but it's long, over 60 years in the United States, that they are so effective, if these were the results of a clinical trial for a drug, we would likely see pressure for fast tracking through the FDA. <laughs> well, there has been some fast tracking in the last year and a half on a national level to support community health workers. From the White House to different federal organizations to the Affordable Care Act to the Patient Affordable Care Act, there has been renewed attention on the value of community health workers in improving quality care and reducing health disparities. They emerged, community health workers, as heroes during the COVID-19 pandemic in Vermont and across the country. We know that. The financial um, commitment that the federal government has shown reflects that community health workers are effective when they are incorporated in social, medical, and public health systems. And many of you, I think about half of you here, are from the medical community, and the others reflect those other systems. So that's also the value in, in, the lear in learning today. CHWs are predominantly comp composed of members of the same marginalized communities that they support. And that is one of their unique gifts. So the power and promise of community health workers paving a path to equity, just a few comments on that, why that's our theme today. The power of community health workers hold in actualizing the meaning of patient-centered and family-centered care by providing that quality care and equitable care. They have power to connect individuals with others in communities and with health, social services, and other systems of care. They have demonstrated their power to teach us that quality care must be equitable care and that equitable care is more than access to services. It means equal quality of services. And without the same quality of service, there is injustice. They have the power to strengthen healthcare outcomes and healthcare teams. So what is the promise of community health workers in Vermont and across the country? To support existing teams, whether in healthcare, social services, or elsewhere. The promise is to improve access and outcomes, as I've mentioned, and the promise of building community and enhancing the quality of life for people in poor, underserved, and diverse communities. CHWs, by definition, are representatives of, for, and by their communities. I'm stealing, of course, from uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in that, as, you, as I know some of you history buffs know. But I can't describe it any better, that they are of, for, and by their communities. And that's why it's important today and going forward that our work honors them, it nurtures them, protects them as individuals, and also advances this profession to build a more diverse, sustainable, and equitable workforce. I'd like to just, uh, before we go into uh, some more introductions, I'd like to mention that I'd like to bring up community, the meaning of community. It's not an accident that the word community is a part of the community health worker job title, which by the way is recognized both nationally and by our State Department of Labor. Wendell Berry is one of my favorite authors and poets from Kentucky. And he described community in a way that I would like to share with you. I believe that the community in the fullest sense is a place and all its creatures. It's the smallest unit of health and that to speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. Community health workers understand that. 
they understand it by who they are and the work they perform and the services they give to other people. A community is sustained by all the people sharing the same space, whether they are related by blood or not, he writes. And then finally, a community is more than a place. It's the mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared and that the place and that the people who share that place define the possibilities of each other's lives. Community health workers define those possibilities of people's lives every day. And we don't recognize it often, but we're starting to appreciate it and recognize it more. I'd like to now move into other introductions, uh, a, few other, a few other introductions before we move into the rest of our, the beginning of our program. This program today was organized primarily by Southern Vermont AHEC with support from the rest of the Vermont AHEC team. And it would not have happened without uh, the, the AHEC team. And as I mentioned earlier, it was also put together and organized with support from the Vermont CHW Steering Committee, which I'll recognize in a minute, and the, and the Vermont Department of Health. T with us today from our team is Jennifer Scott, the Executive Director at Southern Vermont AHEC, back in the, standing in the white sweater in the back of the room. Leah Kittredge, Emily Johnston, Susan White, please uh, raise your hands and wave. And the, they're in the back at the registration table. Carol Knight, Peg Boglione, and the executive director of Northern uh, Vermont AHEC is with us, Nicole LaPointe. Thank you, Nicole. You can stand as well. Thank you all. Thank you to all. Thank you to all. And we also have with us today a special guest representing our federal legislative delegation. And Beth Stern, I would like to ask you to come up. Beth is the outreach representative covering health care services, health care, I should say, for Senator Sanders. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. I wanted to uh, give greetings from Senator Sanders and also from uh, Congressman and Senator-elect Peter Welch. Uh, Tathine Dean was supposed to be here from Peter Welch's office and she couldn't make it today, so she wanted me to make sure that I uh, sent her greetings. Uh, being at this conference is really important so that I can bring information back to Bernie about the work you're all doing, about the challenges you face, and what innovative ideas you have to solve those challenges. I'm, as an outreach representative, I'm really Bernie's eyes and ears on the ground for the issues I cover, which include health care, seniors, disability, and economic justice. And as you know, S Senator Sanders is very concerned about the state of health care in Vermont and in the country. He's worked for many years to try to fix our broken health care system. The good news is that starting in the new Congress, he's expected to be the chair of the HELP Committee, which stands for Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. This is one of the Senate's most influential policy committees. As chair, he plans to focus on universal health care, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, increasing access to higher education, and protecting workers' rights on the job. He was also glad to see that the Inflation Reduction Act passed earlier this year, which made some incremental improvements in our health care system, including extending Accountable Care Act subsidies, finally beginning Medicare price negotiations, and for Medicare beneficiaries, setting limits on out-of-pocket costs for insulin and adding caps to other out-of-pocket expenses. While these were all positive changes, Bernie feels strongly that they did not go far enough. He was also disappointed that Build Back Better, which included much more robust funding for community health and other in-home services, did not pass earlier this year. He really knows that health care does not always happen in a hospital or a health center. Much of what you do is to increase access to health care and provide culturally appropriate information to encourage self-sufficiency and to advocate for individuals and community health needs. He knows that that happens at home, in the community, and meeting people where they are. So really what you do is, is really health care at the ground level, and he very much appreciates that. So on behalf of Senator Sanders, thank you so much for your hard work. Um, like my role, you are the eyes and ears for health care for many, many people, and that is so important. 
Um, I'll be here till noon today, so if uh, during a break you want to seek me out and um, let me know how you're doing, what you're doing, anything you want me to take back to the senator, just find me, and um, I'm glad to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Next slide, please. I would like to just briefly ask you to look at the main objectives of our conference today, in case you haven't seen it in your folders, which I be believe are chocked full of great resources and information about today's event, making connections and building, I don't have that in front of me, <laughs> making connections and building relationships with colleagues and peers across all sectors and communities, learning best practices to build the CHW profession and develop that more diverse, skilled, and sustainable workforce, unifying the voices of CHWs with allies and interested stakeholders. And by the way, I'm, before I go to the fourth bullet, everybody in this room that identifies as a community health worker or a cultural broker or someone with a similar role, will you please stand? Please stand. Yes. Thank you. And I pause there because we want to recognize your power and promise and unifying voices from all over the state. And finally, as an AHEC and also as what's needed for our state, we want to advance CHW workforce development through investments in standardized competency-based trainings and other educational opportunities. We will be talking more about that throughout the day. So now, also, a couple of other special guests, and then I'm going to thank our sponsors, and we will move to our keynote speaker. Leslie Goldman, are you with us today, Representative Goldman? Oh, wonderful. Uh, Representative Goldman has joined us. She is a Democrat from Wyndham County and serves on the House Committee on Health Care. She's a retired family nurse practitioner with over 37 years experience in the medical field. And we welcome her to today's conference. Would you please stand? We want to thank our sponsors, Northeast Delta Dental, for their generous uh, contribution to this event, the Vermont Department of Health Office of Rural Health, and the National Association of Community Health Workers. Uh, all of them have materials and information in the back at the back two tables. So now I'm going to uh, introduce to you our keynote and also another individual from the National Association of Community Health Workers. I regret to say that our original keynote speaker, Denise Smith, the Executive Director of the National Association of Community Health Workers, was just released two days ago from the hospital with pneumonia, lost her voice, and is recuperating fully. But two of her wonderful, um, strong colleagues at the National Association of Community Health Workers, who were already scheduled to come and spend the day with us, uh, are here today. And I'd first like to introduce the Communications Director, Bernadine Mavungo, and she is with us. Stand up, please, Bernadine. Uh -huh. And with us today, who will be giving the keynote in Denise's stead, is Aurora Grant Wingate, who is a member and partner engagement associate with the National Association of Community Health Workers. We are thrilled of their constant support, not just of this conference, but the support to our project uh, and to the health department as well uh, as we started this endeavor uh, eight and a half months ago. Welcome, Aurora, and thank you so much. Next slide, please. 
Ooh, one more, please. I'm going to ask you to go one more again. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's still not it, please. <laughs> Next one. It might be a different slide deck. <laughs> That's the one. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Um, I want to say a big thank you to the Southern Vermont AHEC uh, for hosting this event, uh, especially to Katina Cummings. We have gotten the honor to work with her for the last several months, uh, and it has been just such an honor. Thank you so much for having me here today and for thinking of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Uh, to join you for this event. Uh, my name is Aurora Grant Wingate. I have had the absolute honor to work for Nautua for the past two years. Um, and as Katina said, I am here in Denise's stead to give the keynote. Today, we're gonna talk about a snapshot of the national CHW landscape, particularly focusing on advocacy, COVID-19 uh, and workforce development. Uh, to get us started today, I want to give a brief background on the National Association. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the National Association is a young organization. We are founded just three years ago in April 2019 after several years of planning and organizing by CHWs and allies across the country. Nachua really has a vision to see community health workers united nationally to support communities in achieving health equity and social justice. And we seek to do this through engaging and educating stakeholders, expanding leadership for CHWs, establishing a national voice for community health workers, uh, and enhancing CHW skills and opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, once again, I really want to thank uh, Denise, who was really looking forward to being here, and I hope you all get the chance to meet her soon. Uh, she is my mentor, and I want to pay homage to her, uh, and I hope you all get a chance to meet her very soon. Next slide, please. Thank you. I also want to thank our board of directors. We have a diverse board of directors coming from across the country. Uh, to help develop Nachua. This is CHWs and allies from all corners of the country uh, who are leading us and a few of which are here today. I know Amber Culver is here. I want to give a shout out to her uh, as well as Ben Hummel from Maine and uh, New Hampshire respectively. Uh, next slide please. Nachua is first and foremost a membership organization. Uh, we, ha we are connected to community health workers in all 50 states and several of the U.S. territories. Uh, we now have over 2,100 members nationally, uh, but we know that there are thousands and thousands of other community health workers that we want to bring in and unify together with us. Next slide, please. I wanted to touch on a little bit of what we have learned in the past three years around community health workers. We've learned that many of our members are based in community-based organizations, um, with other community health workers being paced, placed in hospital centers and FQHCs, uh, and that employers of community health workers are, again, disproportionately community-based organizations, uh, as well as working for universities and hospital centers. Next slide, please. When we use the term community health worker, we use it as an umbrella title uh, for many different job titles that community health workers hold, uh, such as promotoras de salud or community health representatives on tribal nations, uh, outreach, wor outreach workers, peer support specialists, and so on and so forth. We wanna recognize the, the depth and experience that community health workers bring and that while we often talk about community health workers coming out of the uh, clinics movement in the 1960s, that many community health workers are bringing with them a rich cultural history that goes back um, centuries uh, in different communities all across um, the world. Next slide, please. I know Katina shared with us earlier the definition of community health workers. Uh, we also endorse that APHA definition, but we also feel that we need even more language to talk about the community health worker profession uh, and that just those few sentences can't always capture. Uh, so we have something called the six pillars to talk more about the workforce, how it's a unique field and it is uniquely community based and that is historic and diverse in a way few other professions are. 
and that it's cross-sector with community health workers working community-based organizations, hospitals, and so on and so forth. And that community health workers are really already a proven workforce. Often when we go into conversations with folks, uh, they want to do a new study in each city that they're bringing community health workers on. But really, community health workers have over 60 years of proven research about their effectiveness. Uh, but, de uh, but despite all that we know about community health workers, the profession still remains precarious in many ways, um, often uh, underpaid and underutilized. Uh, and that's something that we seek to change with unifying. Next slide, please. And of course, we want to talk about the moment that is still happening in COVID-19. Nachua, being a young organization, has largely grown up in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And since the beginning of the pandemic, we have heard from hundreds of community health workers across the country about their unique experiences. We know at the beginning of the pandemic, many community health workers were unfortunately laid off because folks did not know how to properly adapt their roles. Uh, but despite that, we know that community health workers were quickly mobilizing, that they were helping their communities, uh, they were helping navigate to prevention and treatment and eventually vaccines, and that folks continue to do that work. And we want to make sure that we are providing resources as community health workers are getting more and more recognition on how to properly partner with CHWs and respect their self-determination. Uh, we also, thank you. Um, and we also want to recognize all the great movement that has come at the federal and national level on recognizing community health workers. Uh, community health workers have been mentioned in the American Rescue Plan and several different announcements made by President Biden in the National COVID Preparedness Plan and so on and so forth. And we've also seen unprecedented federal funding naming community health workers and funding them. Next slide, please. So what we have learned in the past two years is that respect and sustainability barriers still persi persist today. Uh, that despite the amazing work that community health workers have done across the country, they're still not being properly paid. Uh, and even as pandemic funding is now running out, many community health workers are once again facing those layoffs. We also know that this new rounds of funding has um, unearthed many systemic inequalities and racism in how we fund community-based organizations. Uh, but we also have learned a lot in terms of strategies on how to fund and how to partner. And the, um, the COVID-19 funding has given birth to many different uh, community health worker organizations, such as the great work that's going on in Vermont. And we hope that sustainability uh, can be continued. Next slide, please. Uh, because of all the, the disrespect and the barriers that community health workers were coming up against during COVID-19, uh, Nachua put together a national policy platform uh, through interviewing and bringing together community health workers across the country. They said, what is important for the community-based workforce right now? Uh, and the three things that rose to the top were respecting CHWs, protecting CHWs, partnering with CHWs, and sustaining the workforce. I believe that the policy platform is printed out for you folks, uh, and you can review it. Uh, it has many different recommendations that come from the workforce on how um, to best work with them. And we continue to update that and hope to have a new version out later this year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we also want to lift up the other things that we have gotten to learn since our founding. Uh, we have learned so much more about the, the breadth that different states have in terms of training and infrastructure for CHWs and that we have learned so much in terms of legislation and financing and what community health workers want from their employers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we continue to, to do more research and lift up community health workers to have these leadership opportunities in this research. Next slide, please. I also wanna take a minute to both thank and talk a little bit about our CHW networks and associations. Around 40 states in the US right now have a state CHW network or association. We often define them as having 50% or more CHW membership and or leadership. 
uh, and they are working on issues uh, around policy and sustainable funding and training in technical assistance. We know that during the pandemic, community health worker associations were delivering vaccines uh, and hosting pop-up clinics and doing outreach in the community, handing out masks. And these networks and associations are who created NACHWA. Many of our founding members uh, first founded CHW state organizations. Um, and NACHWA, we take uh, leads from these state organizations and they are really essential to moving forward CHW policy. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm also very excited to announce Nachua has some of the results of our first CHW-led national survey. This is sponsored by Johnson & Johnson's Our Race to Health Equity, uh, and this was launched in 2021. This is a 51-question survey completely designed by CHW leaders across the country, and we're lucky to say that we had 867 participants in all nine regions, um, and the survey really uh, revealed new information to us around advancing professional identity, leadership capacity, and finding opportunities for action. Um, I really want to give a shout out to our 12 leaders who helped develop this survey. Many of them, again, were those CHW association leaders, um, and they continue to work with us, and hopefully we will get to revise this survey again. Next slide, please. Um, CHW sustainability is essential to eradicate social and racial injustice and in inequalities in medical, behavioral health, and social services experienced by persons of color and people living in social vulnerability due to income, language, education, justice, involvement, citizen, gender, and other barriers. And we offer this data to create opportunities for action and reverse harmful practices that create barriers to CHW self-determination, advancement, and sustainability. Um, this data should be used for action to revise harmful practices and barriers to CHW self-determination. Um, and before we start this journey into data learning, um, we wanna talk a little bit about the methodology of the survey. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we asked CHWs to reflect on experiences in the year amid the COVID-19 pandemic and civil unrest. This enormous undertaking in building a state of the art 51 question survey by CHWs for CHWs during this unprecedented time was organized by NACHWA with um, CHW leaders at the helm. On the screen to the left, the data team identified missing responses, explored neutral responses, meanings, removed duplications of entries, and notated any unique characterizations during the data cleaning process. Um, for example, 28% of CHW respondents were from North Carolina uh, because a single employer distributed the survey. Um, we wanna talk a little bit before I launch into the data about what disaggregation means. Um, disaggregation, disaggregating data, means breaking information into smaller pieces to showcase trends and patterns that may not be visible as a whole population. Uh, why we want to disaggregate data, it is critical to, to be able to monitor and describe critical racial disparities and health inequalities uh, by lo location across where we live, lay, pray, get educated, and get our health care. This allows for further examination from a baseline of data to dismantle structural inequities and further prioritize CHW value. Uh, where we see observable and unique differences, as well as where we unite in responses, we report them in this presentation uh, and in our upcoming report. On the right of the screen, we want to express that 867 CHWs from 859 different zip codes responded to the survey uh, between the months of June and, and September 2021. 772 CHWs responded in English and 95 CHWs responded in Spanish. And we also learned um, that CHWs who took the survey spoke additional 27 different languages. Um, and we know, as I mentioned earlier, that CHW is an umbrella term and that in the survey we found that CHWs responded with 93 different job titles that they use among this set. Um, thank you, and I now would like to move to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, today, I'm going to just show you a snapshot of some of the data that we've learned. I wanted to highlight the diversity of the CHW profession nationally uh, by geography, ethnicity, race, race, and culture, and talk a little bit about CHW's roles in network um, and end with self-determination, -determ values, and leadership. Next slide, please. I'm gonna first show a little bit about what we've learned about where CHWs are across the country. Thank you. Um, here on the left and right, you can see where we got responses by state and how many responses we got by region. Um, there you can see uh, where <laughs> the New England region, region is and you can see which states are darker or lighter. Um, and this typically maps to our membership and where we see the most community health workers across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have learned a lot around the race and ethnicity of the workforce. Uh, we knew before the survey that the majority of community health workers were people of color and coming from other marginalized communities. But through the survey, uh, we have learned around a third of community health workers are white, around, oh, excuse me, 43% of community health workers are white. Um, with 31% identifying as African American and so on and so forth in these graphs. Uh, and we also discovered that around 37% uh, identified as Hispanic or Latino. Uh, the way we did this survey was that folks could self-identify with any race or ethnicity. Uh, so on the side there, you can see the many other um, identities that folks held in the survey results. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also learned a lot about the sex and gender composition of the workforce. Um, we can see that it's a heavily driven female staff showing us that 88.6% are female and only 11% male. Um, and we wanna really, and what we know from this is we really wanna make sure that we are encouraging men to become community health workers and additionally um, queer folks as well. We've also learned a lot about the diversity and language of the CHW workforce. Um, we see that around 60% only speak English, but that uh, a total of 27% um, speak both Spanish and English, uh, as well as many other languages. Next slide, please. We also learned a lot around the age and educational diversity of respondents. Um, that CHWs are all different ages, but we also know that in general, that is a young workforce with folks um, only just starting out in the profession. Uh, we also see that community health workers are bringing a, a diversity in the level of education they present um, with around, excuse me, my computer glitched, 30% um, holding a bachelor's degree, 35% uh, hosting a two-year degree or some college. Next slide, please. And from here, we really wanna make sure this data is action-oriented. Uh, what we have learned from this data is we wanna encourage folks to recruit and hire authentic CHWs who are trusted and have shared life experience, culture, and language with the communities they serve. We wanna be removing barriers to recruitment, training, certification, and employment, like educational requirements, past criminal record background checks, and English proficiency requirements. And we wanna prioritize racial health equity, inclusion, diversity, and a trauma-informed approach. And we wanna increase recruitment for CHWs who identify as male and those as non-conforming genders, as well as permanently fund CHW's role, including addressing the social determinants of health, policy advocacy, and research for payers and funders uh, to um, recognize CHWs as assets. And we wanna integrate and compensate CHW's language profici proficiency um, and life experience skills into all direct service. And we wanna invest in CHW's career advancement pathways like certification and continuing education. Next slide, please. We've also learned a lot about CHW's roles in CHW networks across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, from here, we've learned that 45% of CHWs led community-based organizations um, or were members of their state associations. 28% of respondents were members of NACHUA. Um, 
and 12% were members of their state public health association. Next slide, please. In this slide, we want to look more closely to the relationship that we have with local or state CHW network associations or coalitions. Uh, the bar at the very top of the slide shows again that 45% of our surveys takers are members of these organizations and 32% of our survey takers are employees. This is encouraging because it affirms that some of these organizations are receiving funds to hire staff full time. However, the purple bars in the lower half of the slide, where we ask about CHW leadership roles in these organizations, we see opportunities for growth and development. Only 7% of our survey takers are board members and only 3% serve on a committee. Only 5% are paid for their leadership role and 4% are not paid at all for their leadership. A creating space for the leadership that CHWs already possess and building capacity so that CHWs can become future leaders should be essential component, components for organizational development. Next slide, please. Uh, we have seen in the previous slide that CHWs have many different roles in their local or state CHW network, association, or coalition. Uh, this slide explores the various pathways in obtaining a role in a CHW network. We see that well over 50% of our survey takers obtain this role through their employer, while 21% of our survey takers were connected to this organization through another CHW. 12% of survey takers learned about the network on their own, um, and 12% were recruited by another CHW. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the next slide shares the top five statements that CHWs believe are true to describe their network association or coalition. Uh, we see that 35% of our survey takers say that their network provides work-related training or certification, and 34% of networks have CHWs in majority of their membership. 28% um, of survey takers said that their network membership does have a cost, while 20% said there is no cost for their membership. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and when we asked the top three kinds of support that should be provided to CHW networks, um, overwhelmingly we found that 60% said around leadership development, uh, around 50% said communications about the CHW profession and role, and then around 40% said program and or services funding. Next slide, please. Uh, and once again, we want to make sure that our data results are action oriented. We want to encourage folks to establish private and public partnerships focused on innovation across networks that are rooted in cultural and linguis linguistic appropriate community health worker local models. Uh, we want to strengthen education and training materials and lean on CHW networks and associations as a trusted resource. Uh, we want to encourage that CHW should be in leadership positions to every association or network and that self-determination uh, is a top priority. And we want to develop career path lines for uh, future leaders by transitioning volunteers into paid roles for leadership. And we want to fund programs and campaigns to promote awareness of the CHW professional identity. Uh, and we want to integrate broad roles that describe the CHW profession. Next slide, please. Uh, for our last um, section of the data, I want to talk a little bit about what we've learned around self-determination, values, and leadership. Thank you. Uh, leadership development is a step in the CHW career ladder that we all strive towards. Um, on this slide, we ask CHWs to identify the top five items that describe what it means to be a CHW leader uh, from 15 different categories. What we found is uh, the top answer was 68% said to inspire others, 67% said to motivate others, 46% said to address cultural and racial barriers, 42% uh, to be an agent of change, and then 39% said to impact policy to better my community. Uh, in the next slide, we asked folks what are the top three ways CHWs felt that they expressed their leadership as a CHW. We see that the vast majority, 72%, said advocating for community needs and, ne and preferences. 43% said promoting health and racial equity. Um, and then lastly, 37% said advocating for the CHW role to address the social determinants of health. 
CHWs confirm that a key way uh, they express their identity as leaders is through advocacy in, uh, in describing community needs. We also learned that advocacy includes a focus on racial equity. We understand uh, that advocates and community leaders um, uh, take the social determinants of health in all spaces and bring that to their community, their legislation, and in healthcare. Uh, some examples may include buying, uh, gathering buy-in from community stakeholders, taking action in policy matters, continuing education, and maintaining a high standard of service deliver delivery and practice. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, we often find ourselves with an opportunity to provide organizational leadership, and in this slide, CHWs were asked to identify three ways they were interested in building their organization leadership skills. Uh, they selected 40% with community engagement, 36% with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and 33% with effective communication. Next slide, please. And here we have some of our final opportunities for action, which include uh, co-develop justice, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion curriculum in partnership with community health workers to include topics uh, with community health worker core competencies and training programs. And that employers should align the wording and assessment of CHW leadership capacity and readiness with the above descriptions as part of recruitment, job descriptions, promotional evaluations, and other op opportunities. And that workforce studies should continue to explore CHW's unique roles and racial health equity and the social determinants of health. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that was a lot to take in, uh, but if folks are interested in learning more about our CHW national data, uh, please feel free to go to our website. You can download all of our infographics here if any of them spoke to you, as well as watch our webinars where we go uh, more in depth into the data. Next slide, please. Um, so I know I have covered a lot in the last half hour. Uh, so now for these last few minutes, I really want to highlight a couple of key takeaways. Uh, the first and foremost is that we want to invite you to join us uh, at the national level. At the very least, we want to invite you to join our free newsletter where we send out our events and resources with opportunities for you to meet CHW leaders from across the country uh, and access free resources. Um, and next slide, please. We also really want to highlight our Document Resource Center. This is the largest single source um, uh, library that we know of of CHW related policy and research. Uh, this is completely free and available to use on our website. Uh, we are continually looking for new resources and ways for folks to add additional resources. It is meant to be a, a program and a service for everyone across the country. Next slide, please. I also want to give a big plug for our annual Unity Conference. Uh, the annual Unity Conference has been going on for years before Nacho was even a conf um, uh, an organization. And it was really essential for bringing community health workers together and creating that community uh, that inspires advocacy um, and unity. Uh, so we have gotten the privilege of getting to do the Unity Conference uh, for the last several years virtually, and we're excited to say we're going to be back in person this summer uh, to do a hybrid event. This is a really great opportunity for folks to present, um, as well as awards, and get to meet our great board members and other leaders across the country. Uh, and we're going to be putting out more information about that very soon. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up a few minutes early so folks can hopefully have a break. Uh, but I once again really want to thank you for having us. I want to invite you to join us uh, both at the state conferences but also nationally. I want to thank you all for taking time to be here and be together and build community with us all. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, we'll, and Bernadine and I will be around for the rest of the day if folks have questions or comments or uh, about anything I've covered today. So thank you very much.
so earlier. Thank you so much, uh, Aurora, for that amazing presentation. I, I, it was a lot to take in, but I, I think it's exciting because we just, as you know, the Department of Health in Southern Vermont, AHEC in 2022, the middle of 2022 in July, um, developed, co-developed and co-issued this, I think the third survey, right? The third state survey for CHWs and allies and employers. And so it'd be interesting to compare a lot of those results with our survey results as well. So thank you, thank you again, Aurora. I'd like to now recognize individuals in the room by asking them to stand and to thank them, our planning committee members and the CHW steering committee members, many of whom have served on the steering committee since the beginning of the steering committee over four, four years ago or so. Um, they, I would love for all of them to stand and thank them for their service and for being here today. Please stand. S steering committee members and planning committee members, some of whom, <clears throat> I did want to share too that, um, and you're going to find out soon because they will be in the breakout sessions this afternoon. But we are so honored to have some truly national heavy hitters at this conference. Um, with us today is also Amber Culver, who is a CHW and program manager at the North Country Health Consortium in Littleton, New Hampshire with six years of experience helping her community members to overcome barriers and access services. And her team serves in Coos, Carroll, and Northern Grafton counties in New Hampshire. Amber, I was not able to see you when you came in this morning. I hear you, there she is. I saw you for a second. A Amber, please stand. Also, uh, is Ben here, by the way? Ben Hummel? He's, he's on his way. Um, so we have another uh, key person who will be joining us for the afternoon breakout session with Amber, Ben Hummel from Maine, and we will introduce him uh, later. But he is an ally who's collaborated with community health workers across Maine for more than a decade. And he currently works as a contracted staff person with Maine's Public Health Department. He will be around soon. He is on his way. And they will, I know he will be here before lunch. So please feel free to seek out uh, these wonderful experts with their knowledge and expertise. And finally, uh, is Tara in the room? I met, is Tara, Tara Murphy here? She is here at the conference. Uh, she'll be coming in a little later, too. She is an independent management consultant and has worked in health systems reform. She is going to be co-leading the afternoon session on sustainable financing. She's done uh, years of work in Massachusetts and is now consulting around the country. That's Tara Murphy. So please be looking for them, and you will hear from them in the breakouts this afternoon. And now I would like to introduce, and she will introduce herself too, but I'm very honored to, meet, to have met and work with Andrea Nicoletta of the v Vermont Department of Health. We have a real loss at today's conference today, and we'd also like to honor Jen Woolard, who has been at the forefront of the CHW state work for over a decade. Uh, over a decade, and she, of course, as part of the planning committee and leading the steering committee, uh, had planned to be here, but her child is ill, and she unfortunately could not make it today. Uh, and you'll introduce Kana as well, I hope, because I didn't do that earlier. So we have other, other uh, support from the Vermont Department of Health here. Uh, thank you, Andrea, very much. Good morning, everyone. Please give me a hand signal if I need to go up or down on volume here on the mic. Um, it's hard to tell from the front of the room. So thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome. As Katina said, my name is Andrea Nicoletta. I use she, her pronouns. 
and I am the health equity team lead and community health worker coordinator at the Vermont Department of Health. This is a new position. Um, I've been in it for five and a half months or something like that. Um, and I'm so glad and grateful to be here with all of you this morning and today. As you may know, to promote community health worker awareness in Vermont, the Vermont Department of Health and other partners recently worked with a media company to produce a series of videos about the great work that is happening here by Vermont CHWs. While it was posted online pretty recently, we do want to consider today the premiere. I would like to invite you all to consider it a, the world premiere of the Community Health Worker, the first of the series, Community Health Worker video. Um, and if you listen closely, you may hear some familiar voices in it. We are so grateful for the help of everyone who contributed to this video, the Vermont CHWs who lended their voice talents, and the folks who are in the subsequent videos that will be released in the coming weeks, months, soon, um, that are live action documentary style videos following CHWs and the work that they do here in Vermont to support their community. So and again, so many thanks to everyone who was part of this. And I will ask our tech people to roll the video, please. Lack of transportation in rural areas. Food insecurity and financial concerns are just some of the many factors that impact health. Plus, the health care and social service systems can be hard to navigate. For some, these challenges are greater, leading to larger gaps in health. As we work together to solve these barriers, there is one solution already available to us, community health workers. Community health workers are a nationally and state recognized workforce. We connect Vermonters to healthcare, social services, and community resources. We serve older adults, individuals with disabilities, rural residents, LGBTQIA+, BIPOC, migrant farm workers, individuals in recovery, and more. And our benefits are proven. We improve health outcomes, especially among underserved populations. We reduce health care costs for the individuals and the organizations we serve. And we help alleviate time and resource strain on agencies and health care systems. Community health workers often share ethnicity, language, and life experiences with the communities we serve. Which allows us to build relationships and advocate for individuals and communities. Collaborate with healthcare teams and social service agencies to help our clients get the most out of these services. Bridge cultural and language barriers to ensure equal access to all Vermonters. Community health workers go by many titles. SASH coordinator, family strengthening worker, health advisor, recovery specialist, cultural broker, and many more. We are vital to the people we help and the well-being of our state. That's why we are committed to creating a stronger, more connected workforce. Ensuring community health workers are acknowledged, supported, and appreciated at every level. Interested in learning more about community health workers or looking to connect with others in Vermont? Please visit healthvermont.gov slash chw. We hope you all really enjoyed that video, short snippet of, of the profession, of your work. It is posted on YouTube as well as on the health department website, and we'd encourage you to share it as that makes sense for you all. Um, and again, thank you so much to our folks who were involved, and thank you to the folks who are who we are eagerly awaiting your next videos as well. So there will be a few more coming out. All right. 
At this time, I want to welcome up or invite up my co-presenters for the next section on the community health worker landscape in Vermont. Small stage for three people. We're Small stage. <laughs> Small stage. Okay. Here we go. Awesome. Thanks, Andrea. Um, Hi all, my name is Maddie Ruth. I'm a community health worker who gets to work in Chittenden County um, with UVM um, Home Health and Hospice. And so we heard an amazing presentation from Aurora about what is going on nationally, so like massive scale. Um, and we are going to, just with the video, bring it a little closer to home. Um, also realizing, can, we, can you hear me in the back? Just a general thumbs up. Perfect, thanks. All right, so um, again, a thank you for being here. This is very exciting. Um, we are gonna take some time to talk about the CHW landscape in Vermont, um, celebrating our successes and of course the path ahead. Next slide. All right, so our session goals, we are going to learn best practices to build CHW profession and develop a more diverse, skilled, and sustainable workforce, all pivotal in making this work. Um, second, advanced CHW workforce development through investment in standardized competency-based trainings and other educational opportunities. And third, provide an overview of the work in Vermont and um, upcoming efforts. Next slide. So again, we just want to put um, a real, take a real moment to raise up the folks who have been involved um, within the state up to this point through the steering committee. Um, Katina very kindly asked everyone to stand earlier. I'm not going to ask you to do that again, but I just want to thank you um, and know that if we missed you um, on this list, let us know because we we want to celebrate you and the work that you've done beyond um, in your agencies and programs that is now affecting folks across the state. Um, as well, we have folks, um, partners and organizations who have been with us in and out of this journey. So just a, a real thanks and appreciation. And if we could just take a moment to do a general loud clap to celebrate all these people. <laughs> Good loud clap. Thanks, everyone. All right, next slide. And I hand it over. <laughs> Little round robin presenters this morning. We, we got this. So as you heard already from Aurora and Katina, CHWs are not a new profession and they are not, uh, and they are a national profession. I was going to say not local and then I changed my mind. All right. So we just really want to stress that this is a workforce that is maybe that is gaining some recognition, gaining more widespread recognition in this moment. Uh, there's been substantial growth since 2020 in particular, um, and now more and more attention is being given to the unique ability of community health workers to address social determinants of health. COVID-19, as you all know, really elevated the need to invest in community health workers and in this workforce. There was a um, recognition, a new awareness of the value of community-based public health workforces, and COVID-19 relief funding paired with that an opportunity to hire emergency response and recovery efforts, and that together um, is going towards that formalization of the CHW workforce. Many of you may be recipients of grants from the Vermont Department of Health or other places to help fund your community health worker programs due to this moment and the unique recognition for this field that you all are the way to help dis address those disparities that we've been seeing through the pandemic and before the pandemic, but perhaps that the pandemic shown 
a brighter light on. To that end today, we wanted to really highlight five key infrastructure areas that our work here in Vermont through the steering committee, through our grant partners, with all of you is really focused in on to help ensure that this profession continues to see those significant investments. These five key areas work together to support community health workers and the profession. They function differently based on different needs. They function differently in different states. Vermont is working within each of these five areas. Um, and today, we're really going to talk through sort of where we're at and where we hope to be going. The five key areas for those who may not be able to see the slides, professional identity and awareness. You saw the community health worker video. That's part of that effort to really raise that. Workforce development and occupational recognition. You all are here at the CHW conference. You've been at other trainings and, and opportunities. So really focusing in on that. Thinking about organizational capacity and integration financing mechanisms and sustainability, and then research and evaluation. You'll see that sessions throughout the day touch on these five key infrastructure areas, and we really welcome you to bring your experiences with these five areas to us. All right, so we remember the visual that we just saw. We are now gonna dive a little deeper into professional identity and awareness. So let's talk challenges first. Um, so range of job titles, roles, difficult, difficulty to unify and promote common understanding. So again, this is where we have a definition. That's a place to start. Um, we still have a lot of community health workers who don't feel reflected um, either in their job title that they're a community health worker um, or connect with the definition. Um, and so we are working to bring folks together. Again, you're here. We're together. We're making this happen. Um, one more step. So as well, limited understanding of CHW roles and abilities just to build off of that. Um, this is kind of the elephant in the room. This is the, well, you know, can you just tell me what you do? What is a, are you a social worker? Um, I know what a nurse does. Are you like a nurse? Um, this is about figuring out what community health workers do, realizing that we all may have certain pieces that we do with different clients or within different communities, but being able to raise up and celebrate the successes that we have in working with people and connecting them to resources. And the third challenge, oh, sorry. I gave the eye contact, but can we, thank you. Lack of uniform messaging. So nationally and here in Vermont, there are over 40 different job titles associated with uh, the CHW term, 40. This is why I still have to explain to my parents what I do, because in Pennsylvania, yes, CHWs, we're gonna hear about that later, um, but also we come in so many different names and shapes and sizes. Um, and so this is part of our job is really connecting what we're doing every day in our messaging with folks who we might not normally be connecting with. It is the nurses who we're working with um, it is the folks in our town offices who, oh, you know, I was looking for someone like you, but I didn't know who I was looking for. Um, that is a CHW. That's a community health worker. It's raising up what we're doing and celebrating that. I had a lot more words I was going to read, but we're just going to pause on that. <laughs> um, Vermont Pathways. So here is looking ahead. Okay, so state definition scope of practice, promote a common professional identity. So these are things we have done to help us move forward. Um, so we've adopted a state definition in 2019. Um, again, this is celebrating the fact just as Nachua, um, 
there is a lot of recent growth and development and support for this work, and we're celebrating that. Um, so now that there is a definition, we can more easily, hopefully, um, promote the common professional identity of CHWs. Um, again, this is a step forward in clarity of the work that we get to do. Second, statewide CHW survey. Just as Aurora spent a great amount of time celebrating the work of collecting data for the national survey, um, and as was discussed earlier, we've been doing a state survey for a few years. As we know, data connects what we're really doing, the mushiness, to the funding and to our community partners. This is about getting our story shared in a way that folks can understand it and hopefully celebrate it and enhance and sustain it. Um, CHW logo launch. Um, as you maybe have noticed, there's a commonality of green, light blue, dark blue, uh, very intentional, uh, I forget what the color green is. I have it saved somewhere, it's like C704. Anyway, very intentional. Um, we got to work with some folks on a logo, which means consistent colors, consistent um, branding, which is helpful in, again, bringing us together, bringing a bit of um, when folks see that logo, maybe it's just one more visual connection for the folks who are visual out there. Um, this is something that the steering committee worked a lot on um, and are really excited about. Uh, the CHW video highlights, um, as Andrea presented, we're so excited about the video and the folks who helped with that and excited to do more things like that. I still have this idea in my head of um, any of the buses who are that are running right now, I just cannot wait to see a CHW information on the side of that. Not saying that all the other things that are currently advertised are not important, but how great to again, raise up this work that we're doing and really just share it with folks, with our community. Um, work with CHWs, employers, and allies to build relationships and discuss role distinction. Um, so this again is just continuing to work with everyone. We realize that we as CHWs are connecting our clients, our patients, call them what you will, um, with their resources. This is about as well connecting us with our resources and our greater care team and folks that we get to work with. Um, statewide network, it's at the bottom, but it's a really big one. And it's one that we're excited to talk about. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Katina. Thank you so much, Maddie, for that. And for CHWs, diversity is our strength. That is one of the mottos of CHWs. And just to follow up on professional identity, I want to give a huge shout out to the Leah. Is it 14 people that worked with us to develop their own stories about why they are CHWs, why they are proud to do uh, to be a CHW and the unique contributions they've made. Those stories are on beautiful red posters in the back and a little bit around the room. I want to thank Leah Kittredge for organizing that, who is our coordinator for the Northern Region. All 14 of you, how many? 19. I, I Boy, I misspoke. Uh, I would love for all 19 of you to br stand up and be recognized for participating and sharing your story. Please stand if you have a story. This way you can meet them uh, at lunch or different times or just read, the, read their stories on the board or both. Okay, so next slide, please. Oh, you're there. Thank you, thank you. So now we're going to talk a little bit about workforce development and educating and investing in CHWs is a culturally effective way to begin building trust between communities and medical institutions and federal organizations, state organizations, social services as well. When it comes to advancing professional 
development of CHWs and increasingly recognizing the value of this occupation, a lot of good work has begun in Vermont, but we have a long way to go. The key question, at least in my mind and in the discussions we've been holding with you and others around the state, how do we best prepare and support a workforce to address social needs of populations as a component of healthcare delivery? The healthcare systems cannot do it all. We know that. They can't continue to do it all. The key answer, or at least one of the answers, you have the answers, is to educate and invest in a well-trained workforce with defined roles as integral members of the healthcare workforce and who are community-based. So let's look at some of the challenges quickly. There are differing needs for training for CHWs and their employers, right? Some of you are brand new CHWs. I met some of you today. Some of you have been doing this work for 20 and 30 years. CHWs need to have various levels and types of support from their organizations and their employers. And this can look different from organization to organization, obviously. And it can be a barrier, by the way, if everyone has to invent their own. I can't tell you the number of employers that we spoke to with CHWs who told us, who told our team when we interviewed, and we'll talk about our project a little bit later, we had to Google <laughs> What are the roles of CHWs? How do you write a job description for a CHW? They had to Google it and find out. So that's one reason we're building a network is to unify CHWs with their employers and others. Secondly, workforce readiness in some instances continues to be a challenge. People come to the CHW profession from different places and with different knowledge. Establishing the value of CHW positions can also be challenging. So many times there is a focus exclusively on return of investment, though that is critical, by the way. And CHWs have proven to be cost-effective uh, staff. This may rarely happen with other professions where CHWs just need to prove their worth, um, that they are worth their expense, particularly when there isn't any insurance payment for their services. Each state has different experiences. Every state has different experiences. And we can look to what has worked in other states, best practices, what has not worked. And there isn't one universal model. Building a model takes time in Vermont, but we are doing it. And we are also leaning on partners who have, who have developed a community health worker network and have been doing this work for 20, 30, and 40 years. And they are willing and able and happy to work with us. So what are the pathways then uh, that we have been actively engaged in to promote workforce development? So using best practices for trainings is paramount. Uniform trainings, and I'm key, I want to I want to emphasize the word uniform trainings that incorporate the CHW definition, scope of practice that the steering committee developed over time with CHWs and core competencies is beneficial. In fact, it's necessary. Development of statewide uniform standardized trainings based on core competencies and offering pilot trainings, I'm pleased to say, is underway. That is a first for our state, and that is part of the work of the project that we are doing. CCV as a community health certificate program. Scholarships are available to support some of them. And we have developed and are in the process, we Southern Vermont AHEC, with you, many of you, are developing a CHW Alliance, which will provide guidance and recommendations on CHW education and training efforts. That's a multi-stakeholder organization composed of CHWs, supporters, and allies. The effort currently underway will explore what is best for the CHW field in Vermont. Credentialing, a certificate, what is the best path forward? And we will have a very interactive process to, to answer some of those questions. 
There's much support for standardized training in the state, but it's unclear right now what that will look like. Next slide, please. So organizational capacity and integration is key for a successful CHW program once it's launched. Fostering supportive organizational environments that fully integrate CHWs uh, as essential workforce into team-based care is a critical component of building the workforce and sustaining it, not just bringing them in, but sustaining it. It's a key role of an organization to fully support the personal and professional development of CHWs. It includes recognizing them for their, versatile, their versatility and the range of services that they can provide. And it means promoting their authenticity, their uniqueness, and the character of the CHW profession. So the first question in an organization ready to develop a CHW program, and raise your hand if you're in the process of developing a new CHW program, I see some of you in the audience that you are doing that, is engaging all stakeholders. It's a critical initial step to develop that program. Building the buy-in of key leaders in your organization, the influencers, from administrators to clinicians to clinic management to social workers, and guess who else? To patients. Patients need to understand the unique role of community health workers in a setting. That's very important if that's communicated. Does the organization have infrastructure support in place? Does it understand the multitude of components that guarantee CHW success, recruitment, to community involvement, to equipment and supplies, to policies, hiring policies, and more and more and more? That's, a, that's an organizational capacity question. So I'm not going to spend more time on the, cha on, on the challenges, but I'm going to talk about the pathways very briefly. So fostering supportive organizational envi environments, as we said, is critical. And by the way, that's going to be discussed in, in our breakouts this afternoon. From recruitment and hiring practices to integrating CHWs across health into healthcare teams, environments must support the development and the work of CHW levels. Finally, it's important to identify policy supports that build this infrastructure and foster even enhanced utilization of CHWs in improving individual care and long-term community well-being. It's been thrilling the last few weeks for our project for people to contact us that we had not spoken with, organizations, state and regional. Some of you are here today. We're thinking about hiring outreach workers who will be part of the community, who come from the community to educate patients on X or to educate people and support them on Y, to provide informal guidance to them on Medicaid, Medicare programs. And they've come to us and said, I think we need a CHW. So it's exciting that this conversation, these conversations are happening. We know that there are models in Vermont that are working well. How can we measure? and evaluate the impacts of CHWs and share those widely across organizations and clinical care settings so that all of you can see the possibilities. Okay, next slide, please. Andrew, thank you. So this pillar talks about financing mechanisms and sustainability, which I know is probably on everyone's mind, right? Many CHW positions are grant funded and a loss of funding not only risks those positions, but risks a loss of community relationships. So while grant funding has allowed the profession to grow in Vermont, it does have a cost or a trade-off. Um, we also know that because of grant funding, it also takes time to just get grant funding and to do reporting and all of those pieces. Sh uh, Short-term funding also can mean that, as we said, when that funding potentially ends or isn't renewed or 
you know, goes away, that those relationships with the community can become a barrier, can become lost. And lack of funding is really a concern. Organizations would hire more CHWs if they had the funding to do that. We heard that from over two thirds of CHW employers in the state. There are multiple streams of funding that exist, but they may not be available to every organization and every CHW. As we've talked about, there's grant funding, but not everyone may qualify or have the capacity to, to adopt grant funding. As we've talked about insurance reimbursement, if you are a community-based organization that does not bill insurance, that is not a funding stream that's necessarily going to work for you. So really considering all of these different streams and which ones folks are able to leverage in order to continue to grow and strengthen this pro profession. Medicaid reimbursement, one piece of the puzzle. We're going to talk in our, our sustainable financing session this afternoon a bit more about that. That's one piece of the puzzle, and we are also aware that it is not the only piece. So our pathways here, it's vital to answer the sustainable funding question. We, we have good models to look at from other states and have to find the model or the combination of models that's going to work here in Vermont. Our breakout session this afternoon is going to talk a bit about what has been done to fund CHW positions in other states that could be models Vermont would be willing to explore. We have some really amazing experts with us to talk about their experiences and their work in this avenue. You have in your folders, and you will hear throughout the day, we have also already set up some Medicaid 101 trainings in January with Carl Rush to talk with CHWs and others about how to talk about Medicaid funding and how to advocate for inclusion of community health workers in that. So we're really excited to have Carl uh, able to offer those for everyone. And you can find more information in your folder. And also the Department of Health is exploring funding models for Vermont in partnership with Carl um, this year coming, well, now through 2020, mid 2023 about what what we can get to work here in Vermont for sustainable financing. So really exciting work, really important work, and we really look forward to having those conversations today and continuing beyond. Our last pillar on the next slide is research and evaluation. So some of the seeing research and evaluation as a topic for these key infrastructure areas may be surprising. What we know is that policymakers are looking for evidence-based policy initiatives. As Aurora said earlier, there is research that we don't have to already like redo it. It exists in so many forms. It's leveraging that. We have, as Katina talked about, the Community Health Worker Survey, leveraging our existing research and thinking about other ways we can demonstrate to the folks who are waiting for us to demonstrate or who are demanding us to demonstrate that these programs, community health worker programs, are vital and they work. We all know this, and some people need to see percentages and numbers. So evaluation is not robust. It, it is not well-funded. It is a commitment of time. Um, it is co a commitment of money to do robust evaluation, which is a challenge. It is generally associated with one program or one organization and not always generalized out to the field as a whole. It is resource heavy for an already under-resourced profession. So as we're talking about here in Vermont, these yearly CHW surveys are have been going on. This is the third year, 2022. The results will, 2022 results will be released really soon. We've had some numbers we were able to pull out for today, but the full reports are not ready yet. But that information will be posted online when it is. We think about cost data like return on investment or reduction in, in uncompensated care. 
Uh, employers are also noting some frustration over lack of sharing information between healthcare and community-based entities as part of the survey. And so thinking about these connections that you are all making today is, again, a pathway to like bring yourselves together with folks in your communities, in other communities in Vermont, and support one another in this. I think the question for us as a state is thinking about how can we support evaluation consistency in a way that does not feel burdensome and in a way that feels supportive. So is it helping specific programs design effective research and evaluation plans? Is it using what, making sure we all are aware what's already out there? Just thinking about how we can really leverage our resources. Those are the five in key infrastructure areas that we're going to really focus in on throughout the day. We wanted you to have this sort of landscape. I say throughout the day, but it's like throughout time. Um, we are really excited to be able to have those conversations with you. And now I'm going to have Katina come up and talk a little bit more about uh, their work before we send you to your break in 10 minutes. Stick with us. You got this. We'll, we'll see you throughout. All right. Got lots of noise here. Okay. Give me one second, please. So we are <clears throat> the Vermont CHW Workforce Initiative has been since the middle of February holding conversations across the state. I think we've met with probably all of you or most of you here in an effort to build a statewide network. I happen to believe I'm giving you my personal opinion at the moment, which could border on professional opinion, but take it for what it's worth, that we have not had a robust unified community health worker workforce in Vermont in great part because community health workers are generally working in isolated fashions and are not able to communicate with each other uh, across organizations or across sectors. They don't yet have their own voice in Vermont, but one reason we're here uh, and a key part of our project is to not only unify CHWs, but have that voice organized in a, in a collective way through some kind of, a, of an organization or a member-led association. There are over, I believe, please correct me, Aurora uh, and uh, Bernadine, there are over 35 statewide CHW associations in, in the country that, rep, that are member-led associations. And they do everything from networking to providing uh, sessions, training sessions for each other. Uh, they have webinars with each other. They come up with topics that they need to discuss to advance their profession and so forth. We do not have one in Vermont. So part of our work has been to bring you together through our regional meetings that we held in September and October. And now this is the culmination uh, of that work. So a network, a network is so critical uh, to develop uh, this project. Keep going, please. Next slide. So why build a network? Why build a CHW network? There are several key reasons. Promote that statewide CHW organization. And I didn't mention leadership, but we did talk about that earlier, and Aurora did as well. Providing opportunities for CHWs to be leaders that they are. Secondly, to unify the allies with CHWs, champions and other stakeholders. Many of you allies are in the room today. To promote pro uh, uniform programs and best practices. They are there. The research uh, documents those best practices. What are they and how can we apply them in our state? Expand the healthcare infrastructure with CHW workforce beyond pandemics. 
we, that has been the recognition nationally that CHWs are needed now after COVID. We've had discussions with some of you uh, Department of Health local district directors recently. We've been talking about CHWs on emergency preparedness teams and WIC programs, uh, peer support specialists. So they are already CHWs because of the definition of, of them coming from the community and lending uh, support to, uh, to pregnant mothers and postpartum moms. Um, advancing a more diverse, skilled, and sustainable CHW workforce. That is a key reason to build this network. Please, next slide, please. So I'll quickly go over these. What we have been doing from March through no November it, many of you know this. We've been identifying the, uh, the CHW, uh, identifying new state CHWs across the state to learn more about what you do. Though some of you have taken the CHW survey, we've discovered that in our conversations, and I really call this a listening tour more than anything, that many CHWs did not know about the survey. They did not consider themselves CHWs, as Maddie said. And so this has opened up a whole new level of qualitative research that we hope uh, to gather and to publish uh, at some point soon. Educating and communicating with employers, prospective employers and other stakeholders interested in CHWs. We've been meeting, we have met with, and you'll see on the next slide in a minute, uh, over 65 organizations across the state. Assessing the landscape and employer readiness for CHWs, very key, key as we talked about earlier. Creating statewide uh, training technical assistance, I'm jumping now because of time. And we have been working to encourage investments for statewide CHW workforce development. Those investments on an individual organizational level, but also on a state level through state funding and sustainability and on a federal level, there is legislation that is pending in the US Congress to support CHWs. Let's go ahead, please. Next slide. So our project, as I mentioned, has been leading many conversations across the state about workforce needs, trainings, voluntary credentialing and roles of CHWs in performing uh, their current services in their work. But let me say what's been so exciting about these conversations. We've been talking with everyone from CHWs to executive directors, to nurses, to social workers, and they talk with us, we ask them, who is working in your community to reduce health disparities? Oh, you know, we have an outreach coordinator that does X, Y, and Z. We have a health coach. We have a part-time health coach who is also doing outreach work in the community. We have care coordinators who are working not in just clinical settings, but in non-clinical settings. Many care coordinators are here today, and we've met with them about the work they're doing to eradicate disparities in the social determinants of health. So this has been an exploratory process for us, and we're grateful that you have opened yourselves to have these conversations with us as we move the project forward. I think it's clear we have met with over, the numbers are even lower, um, they're understated here, we have met with over 200 CHWs allies and leaders in the last six months and held numerous meetings, mainly in person. Um, and we've met with representatives from regional and state organizations as well, not just, not only uh, local organizations. Next, next uh, slide, please. I should mention too that we met with hospitals, clinics, SASH coordinators, you're here in large numbers today, we thank you, workforce development organizations, immigrant, migrant, and refugee organizations, free clinics, pediatric practices across the state, community action agencies, blueprint community health teams, program managers, LGBTQ groups. Those are, I want you to know those, that that's the diversity of the organizations that we have been meeting with. And finally, just so you know, I would love to share this with you because some of our employers said this was a very helpful way to look at community health, the health worker models. There is not a one size fits all. 
There are several types of CHW programs. These six major ones have been identified nationally by the NQHC uh, and also RHI Hub, Rural Health Information Hub, key, key models. And they vary, of course, what kind of a model you adopt or choose based on the services that you need, that patients need, that community members demand and need. I've met a lot of you that are starting to hire community health workers. We have our team for the homeless populations in your states. There are different homeless population CHW programs in Vermont, but you may not know that there might be one in Rutland, and there's also one in the northern part of the state. Again, a value of having a network. These models can all be adapted to meet community needs. So for rural areas in particular, components from one model can be adapted to another uh, program model to address community needs. So I wanted to share that with you. I actually had one. Yeah, we have a minute. OK. The last thing I wanted to share that's so important is that we had one leader in a community health center who said, I'm all for community health workers, and let's, let's hire them and organize them, and let's, let's pursue this project. But they didn't know that they could, if they didn't hire a community health worker, they could partner with other organizations that do, they could also contract with community health workers, organizations, like our refugee immigrant migrant groups as well. There are all kinds of opportunities. You don't have to hire directly a community health worker. But by building this network, you will know where they are and how you can partner. Thank you so much. And so a final slide and a breath before we let our bodies stand up and take a breath. Um, if you wanna close your eyes, if you just wanna listen, look at your neighbor, I'm just gonna read this out loud. So today and every day, we are thankful for our state's community health workers and their compassionate service to improve the whole health and well being of individuals and to support communities in achieving health, equity, and social justice. Thank you. So now we're going to have a 15 minute break. And I didn't, sorry, I don't have my time until Till 11.10, 11, 11, yeah, 11, <laughs> uh, the restrooms are out this door to the right. There's also additional, and there's like big ones to the left. Addition, the right, additional ones to the left. Uh, please enjoy your break. Have a cup of tea or coffee, and we'll see you back here uh, for a fun exercise so you can learn from each other, uh, a tabling exercise in just a minute.
we can get it delivered to your tables because our speaker is waiting. Our two speakers are one o'clock. They are waiting. They're joining us remotely. So we need to move forward with them. And worst case scenario about the dessert is you take them into your breakout sessions at 1.30. How's that? But it's coming. There's no mistake. Okay. So, um, This afternoon, we're thrilled to be joined by a doctor who is a champion of the community health worker movement in, in the country, across the country, Dr. Shreya Kangovi and Ashley Harris. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello there. Welcome. Welcome. Dr. Shreya Kangovi and Ashley Harris. And you saw the title of their presentation, which we're very excited about, Cultivating Supportive Work Environments for Community Health Workers. That's important for all of us, of course. She is, Dr. Kangovi is the founding executive director of the Penn Center for Community Health Workers and an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. She's one of the nation's leading experts on improving population health through evidence-based community health worker programs. She led the team that designed IMPACT. IMPACT is a standardized, scalable program that enables community health workers, trustworthy individuals from the communities they serve to improve health. IMPACT has been tested in three randomized controlled trials and improves <clears throat> and improves chronic disease control, mental health, and quality of care while reducing hospital stays by 65%. She will talk to you more about impact uh, during, during her presentation. I'd also like to introduce, well, Dr. Kangovi, I'm gonna ask you to introduce uh, Ashley Harris, who is a CHW extraordinaire and also at the Penn Center. Would that work, Dr. Ha uh, Dr. Kangovi and Ashley, since you're a team here? So welcome, and welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're delighted that you're participating with us in Vermont and Dr. Kangovi. Thank you, it's so nice to be with you all. Um, and I wanna thank uh, my co-presenter, Ashley Harris, in advance for her remarks. Um, and I'm actually gonna let her introduce herself in a moment, um, but maybe I'll start out by just framing us up a little bit, if that sounds okay. Of course. All right. So um, should I go ahead and share my screen? All right, let me know if folks can hear and see okay. There's a minute of delay until it crosses over. Okay, y'all can see my screen? Yes. Great. So I wanna start um, by telling a little bit of history um, and it goes back to the mid 1990s. So in, in 1995, there were two social scientists named Bruce Link and Joe Fallon. And they actually came up with a pretty radical new theory. Um, they argued that health inequity wasn't just an imbalance of disease, but rather it was an imbalance of power. That fundamentally, you know, health inequity wasn't caused by germs, um, mm -hmm. but it was caused by a lack of voice, a lack of control over one's living conditions, a limited set of behavioral options. And so therefore they argued you couldn't treat health inequity with pills or devices or even vaccines, power had to change hands. So what does that mean to us in 2022, you know, in the Vermont Community Health Worker Association Conference? And what would a transfer of power within health and healthcare even look like? To whom should the power flow? And with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ashley, and give her a chance to tell us a little bit about who she is and, and what she does. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ashley Harris, and I am a senior community health worker at Penn Center for Community Health Workers. So just to give you a little brief overview about who I am and what I'll do, what I do is um, myself, I was raised in Philadelphia and I still live here. But just like a lot of the patients that I work with, I wasn't raised with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was actually raised by a single mother and my mom. She became disabled as a child when she was about 10 years old because she was hit by a drunk driver. Driver. Although she grew up with a disability, she never let that stop her from doing anything. She used her experiences and her wisdom to help other people. She went on to even help write the policies and procedures for the Americans with Disability Act in Philadelphia for housing and employment. But so I get that drive from my mom. Just like her, I overcame a, a lot of challenges in my life, you know. So I use that my same experiences you know, um, to help other people. So basically what I do is I reach out to people who live in the community. I provide them with support based on who they are and what they need. I don't talk at them. I listen to them. I want to know what it is that they feel they need, you know, and how I do that is by getting to know them, you know, understanding them, their life story, where they come from, because all of these are major factors on how you treat people and how you, you care for them and connect with them. So I meet people from all walks of life. Um, I'll give you an example of a gentleman that I met and we'll call him James. And he was referred to me because he was struggling with drug addiction. Um, people were treating him like he was so difficult, but they were really intimidated by James. You know, he was a tall, husky, big black man, and they were just, just intimidated, you know, but I sat there, I listened to James. I, you know, I treated him with love and compassion. And I found out that James was a big sweetheart. I felt like James wanted her to fly. He was tall, you know, real big and burly, but he wasn't gonna hurt you. You know, he just wanted somebody to, you know, treat him with respect. And as I talked with James Moore, I found out that he was um, involved in a tragic incident where him and his sister was using, and unfortunately his sister overdosed. Um, and James been, has been carrying that burden. You know, he was charged with it. He was ultimately blamed for it by his friends, his family, everything. So he was like the outcast. He, that's not some type of guilt that you just get over the next day or in a few years. He never recovered from that, you know? So as I got to know James, um, and I understood where he went, what direction he wanted to go in. He wanted to be sober. He wanted to live a normal life, you know? So I got him um, in a, a rehab to um, start his sobriety. And what I did for him when he got there, I made him a love package. It included all of his favorite snacks, underclothes, pajamas, which he really loved and really was a hit, pajamas, because he hadn't worn them since he was a kid. And I didn't think too much of it, but that was the major one, you know? It made him, just that small gesture, it made James feel loved again. He felt like he actually mattered to somebody. Um, and that got him motivated, you know, and have hope for his own future. From there, James, I got him enrolled in the literacy program. That got him amped up even more. And he was off to the races. Like, he was on his path to recovery. He was doing his thing. And that was really, really big for James, you know. But... I'm not going to talk your head off. I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I pray everyone leaves here feeling more confident and dedicated to helping and healing other people. And um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And I know that everyone in the audience can feel your heart and see the impact of the work that you do in your community. Um, I want to build off of what we just heard from Ashley, um, and I just want to confirm, again, can folks see my screen that I switched back over to? Yes. Great. So um, just to take a step back and look at the overall healthcare landscape, the biggest companies, not only in the healthcare sector, but in the entire U.S. economy, are making huge bets on the push of healthcare out into the community. In order to win those bets, they are going to have to break out of not only the hospital walls, but the clinic walls to deliver better health at lower cost. 
And I'd argue that it's not going to be easy for them to get there because they're constrained by the health workforce. In the United States, most of the American health workforce are clinicians like me, um, who are MDs, APP, CNAs, home health aides. Um, and we tend to really focus on the 15% of what drives health outcomes, which is the medical care. And we're not as well positioned to reach beyond that and address the social, behavioral, economic, and environmental factors that we know are really critical at driving health, particularly for the 81 million and growing Americans who are on Medicaid. And this has been the case for a while, but I'd argue that we're at a breaking point. You know, clinicians have been asked to play both offense and defense for generations. Uh, there's a lot of burnout. Uh, there are massive clinical workforce shortages and the costs of our care are threatening the US economy and we do not have the outcomes to show for it. So I'm very excited having done this work for 12 years with my colleagues. I really believe that we are at the moment where I can safely say that community health workers are the new American health workforce. And I just want y'all to give yourselves a round of applause, community health workers in the room. It's been a long fight to, to get awareness, to get recognition. But if you talk to health leaders across the country right now, they know who you are. And you don't have to start by explaining you know, the basics. Obviously, we all know that community health workers are defined not just by their training, but by who they are and what they do. They are trustworthy people who come from within the communities they serve. They share that life experience, just like Ashley described, sharing with the communities that she serves. And they meet people where they are, and they get to know them as people, and they provide support. Um, holistic support to enable them to improve their lives and their health. So um, we are seeing the workforce grow um, at a faster rate than any other health workforce almost in the country. But what's really critical, I think, in the next stage of this workforce trajectory is how do we make sure that community health workers, what do they need and how do we make sure they have it um, in order to do their best work? So that's the next part of the remarks that I'm going to transition to. And to do that, I'm gonna tell you the story of how we built impact, um, which um, as Katina mentioned, is the most widely used community health worker program in the country. Um, it's used in 20 states um, by 50 organizations and we've built it over the past 12 years. And I wanna tell you the story, not because, you know, certainly we're the only community health worker program in the country, um, but just because we've been at this for a while and I'm hopeful that there are some lessons along the way. So how did we begin doing this work? It started 12 years ago um, with another colleague of ours, um, a woman named Tamala Carter. And I first met Tamala Carter back in 2010, and I was immediately just struck by her face. She has this kind of face that, you know, if you see like Ashley smiling, because if you meet her, you just kind of want to tell her your whole life story. Even if you're sitting next to her on a bus, she just makes you open up to her. Um, she's that, got that natural empathy. And so she and I partnered up and what we did was we went out into the communities of West and Southwest Philadelphia, um, and we interviewed 1,500 people on porches and shelters and hospital bedsides. And we asked these people, what makes it hard for you to stay healthy? And what would you do differently? What do you think that the healthcare system should be doing differently to help? And so we heard a lot um, from these people who were smart, resilient individuals. The main themes that we heard were, number one, that they needed help with the real life issues that were making them sick. It wasn't about that 15 minute doctor's appointment, but it was about the loneliness, the discrimination, the trauma. Number two, they wanted that support to come from someone to whom they could relate. And they had a hard time relating to nurses, social workers, case managers, who typically came from like a really different socioeconomic and lived background. And then finally, they wanted to stay in the driver's seat. They were sick of being told what to do. They were sick of being cycled through systems. Again, these are smart, resilient people. And just like the rest of us, they knew what they needed and they just wanted some support and resources. So when I heard these lessons, um, they really made me sit up and think, wow, they're describing community health workers. And I had had the chance to observe the community health workforce in my home country of India. So I knew that they could do magic. And so I started to wonder, well, why hasn't this workforce already hit prime time, you know, in the United States? And what can we do to get there? 
So to answer that question, I did like a slightly crazy thing. I locked myself up for two months in my apartment and I read every single article ever written about the community health workforce in their 300 year history, because this workforce has been around and has a, a tremendous um, history behind it. So I, I, I read about uh, the workforce. I also spoke to many of you um, who had been working in these programs for at least 100 years in the United States, um, but also you know, these programs have been running longer in international context. So spoke with a lot of people working in and running these programs. And I expected to hear that the problems were just you know, lack of funding or political will. Um, but what I actually heard about was nitty gritty implementation challenges, uh, high turnover, ill-defined workflows, uh, lack of supervision. And so those are the problems that um, my team has spent the last 12 years tackling. Uh, this is sort of, you're looking at impact. You know, these are our secret sauces. We basically took apart this centuries old workforce and thought about, well, what can we do to make sure that community health workers like Ashley can do magic, but not accidentally, you know, on purpose with consistency. And so just at a high level to talk through some of the, the, these pillars, because you know, hopefully there's some lessons here. Um, the ordering of these verticals matters, right? Um, we tend to, particularly in healthcare, have a training bias. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we, you know, how do you become a doctor? You go to medical school, how do you become a nurse? You go to nursing school. So let's just, you know, we train and credential and certify people. But we quickly realized, you know, you can't train somebody to be an Ashley Harris, right? It is a calling. Um, sociologists describe community health workers as natural helpers. I call community health workers compulsive altruists. <laughs> and that's because like on a Monday, if you ask Ashley or Tamala or anybody, like, what'd you do this weekend? They were still helping people. They were like baking for, you know, a local charity or, you know, serving food at a, at a food pantry. The rest of us are binge watching Netflix. And so they just, they have it, you know? So you have to recruit for that. You can't train for that. And then we realized, you know, you can't just find those people just by posting a job on Indeed or on your employment website. Instead, we looked for natural helpers in places they're likely to be found, community-based organizations. Again, those, you know, block captains associations, PTAs, uh, food pantries. And then when we got this, you know, pool of candidates um, enhanced with natural helpers, we had the guts to throw away their resumes because I would argue the letters behind your name do not matter for this role. Instead, we developed really um, intensive psychology-based interviews to screen for social traits like empathy and non-judgment and good listening skills and reliability. So those are some lessons from our hiring pillar. Uh, next, of course, you know, there is training is critical. Um, and, you know, we, like many other training programs across the country, really believe in popular education. Um, and we also think it's really critical to train not only community health workers, but supervisors and even organizational executives. Um, Ashley, for example, um, is involved with, and I don't know if you want to say a word about this, Ashley, um, an initiative where community health workers are actually training the C-suite um, of Penn Medicine. So maybe I'll just pause for a second and give Ashley a chance to talk about that just for a moment. So um, yes, I implemented the CHW mentorship program and it was very exciting and nerve wracking too, because you didn't think like, you know, these C-suite executives would listen to little old me. Like, what can I really tell them about, you know, how to run a company or what needs to happen? But it was very, um, I want to say enlightening because I got to understand, you know, these execs, how they were raised, where they came from and their way of thinking. And basically, by doing that, it's just like now we're like kind of getting on the same page. They see where they can make a change at. We see where we can make a change at. And we're coming together collectively to make a, a bigger change for a whole for the health system. So it's something amazing that we're doing. And I'm so excited um, to be a part of it and actually see something like this happening. You know, we really, it feels, it feels great because, you know, we have a seat at the table and we're being heard and they're actually listening and taking heed to what we're saying and understanding like this doesn't work for everybody you know how it's been done we have to you know change the will and give 
switch, you know, power. You gotta, they can't have all the power to make all the decisions because they don't really understand what's really going on at the ground level. And we do, we have a better understanding of it. So you need it, so it works. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. That's been one of the, the, the most exciting things to see, uh, and particularly in this past year. Um, so training certainly important. Then, you know, it's a matter of connecting community health workers to the right patients or clients at the right place and time. And then, you know, what we were thinking, you know, when we designed impact is this is the next part is when the magic happens. It's the workflows, the conversation guides that impact community health workers use to get to know their patients or clients as people. As Ashley mentioned, you know, this is about learning somebody's life story. It's about asking that person, James, what do you think we should do in order to improve your life and your health? And then doing that, whether it's, you know, reconnecting with estranged family, battling an eviction notice, planting an urban garden, or getting a better primary care doc. This is what a transfer of power in health looks like. Um, we do not do this in healthcare. It is radically different from what we typically do. We like to tell patients what to do, and we like to use big data or checklists to guess what they may need. Impact community health workers ask, and then they listen. Then the final thing that we created was a supervision layer to, no to make sure that community health workers were getting the support that they needed as a workforce. And this includes you know, elements like escalation pathways. You know, what do you do if you have a suicidal patient or a patient who's having a clinical emergency? You know, safety and well-being for the workforce, career ladders, clinical integration. And then we kind of punched key performance indicators across all of these verticals so that we could ensure the system was working as intended. It turns out when you build a system this way, um, you can really achieve some exciting outcomes. And we know this because we then, after we built IMPACT, tested it in multiple randomized control trials, which is the same way that you would test a new drug or a medical device. It's a gold standard of science. And we followed 9,398 patient months across all different kinds of conditions. So this isn't you know, just a diabetes intervention or just for high-risk pregnant women. This is for people. You know, and the criteria were basically that you had to live in a high poverty zip code um, and be insured by Medicaid and have just you know, a very kind of low-level medical risk. Um, and so when you take that broad swath of our population and you partner them with an impact community health worker, you see these kinds of savings that we're really after in the healthcare system, you know, savings uh, or improved outcomes that we're really talking about in the healthcare system. So we see savings, high engagement, improved health, really high levels of satisfaction. So uh, next, I just want to uh, pivot and kind of round out our remarks by talking about the policy environment. Um, and so again, I think we are at a really critical inflection point. I've never seen this much policy momentum behind the community health workforce. And I, I know that you all are tracking some of the really exciting um, you know, momentum at the federal and state level. To drill down, you know, Ashley and I are part of a group of community health workers um, and community health worker allies called CHAMPS, um, which is community health workers advocating for movement and policy and practice. And we've um, had about 2,500 hours of conversations with community health workers and groups across the country over the past um, 18 months uh, to understand, you know, what do community health workers think um, would really enable their growth as a workforce um, in ways that they would feel really good about. And it kind of boils down to two main aspects. Number one, as we all know, there needs to be sustainable financing. Um, we are kind of over it with grants, <laughs> you know, it's just like not the way that anybody else is paid for their work. So community health workers shouldn't be either. And so I do think that if you've been following, there's been some really exciting developments on the Medicaid and Medicare side that I won't go into great detail about, but hopeful that the financing is coming. Um, so then the, the next piece, I think, which is equally critical is that when that money comes, um, we need to make sure that there are guardrails in place to preserve the community health worker professional identity and to create the right work environment and ensure the quality of the work that you all do with your clients is not um, tempered. And this is really important because we've seen this time and time again, when funding comes, uh, it can change things and it can really corrode the professional identity of who community health workers are. 
And there are, um, I think, some really important um, documents that folks should take a look at, and I'm happy to send those links afterwards. But the Community-Based Workforce Alliance, NCQA, and even the World Health Organization have pointed to what are the best practices for community health worker programs that would, again, allow us to preserve your professional identity and create a good work environment, as well as um, make sure that you're able to do your best work. They, they tie actually to some of those same pillars that we talked about in this previous slide, you know, hiring the right people, uh, training them appropriately, matching them with the right individuals to serve, ensuring that they are able to take a holistic and flexible and person-centered approach to supporting individuals in their communities. And then finally, making sure they have the right supervision, um, compensation, career ladders, and practices for clinical integration. So those are the kinds of pillars that I think that you all should be advocating for for yourselves. Um, and I want to take a moment to kind of talk about you know, the, the two common approaches that we're starting to see for these labor guardrails and also for work environment or, or, or uh, quality guardrails or also labor guardrails. So um, the typical approaches um, are you know, training and certification or what are, we're starting to see now, which are these program standards. Again, training and certification um, certifies individual community health workers based on whether they have completed an approved training program. And that's probably the model out there that you are most familiar with because it you know, tends to be the easiest thing to do. You, know, you just kind of certify an individual that they've you know, approved, uh, uh, taken an approved training program, yes, no, okay, done. And then there's program standards, which basically certify not this individual CHW, but the organization for following best practices for hiring, training, compensation, career ladder, work practice, and supervision. So there's a huge difference there, actually, um, both in, in terms of whether these approaches achieve their intended goals. So let's look at them um, kind of systematically. One of the goals, obviously, is to, you know, for these types of guardrails to ensure high quality of outcomes for the patients that community health workers serve. Now, there's been studies of the training and certification approach, and it actually doesn't affect the outcomes um, that community health workers deliver in and of itself. And again, that's because training is important, but it's not sufficient without all of the other guardrails. Whereas with the program standards, there is evidence of improved quality. And that comes not only for, from literature in the United States, but from a lot of other countries as well. Again, if you build programs who hire the right people, pay them, um, promote them, have the right work practices and have a supervision layer, not only is the workforce happier, but they're actually delivering better outcomes for their patients. And then let's think about the other um, objective here, which is, you know, for some of these guardrails, it's like, hey, let's do this so that we can advance the workforce and create a good labor environment for the workforce. If you look at, well, does training and certification accomplish that? It does not. Um, and actually, there was a study that came out recently that showed that um, training and certification actually increased pay inequities. In other words, it improved salaries for white male community health workers, but it actually did nothing to improve salaries for people of color and for women. The second concern is that sometimes it can weed out natural helpers, you know, like Ashley or Tamala, who may be, you know, exactly the right people, they have the right community health worker heart, but maybe they can't afford the training program or the certification, or maybe they can't, you know, navigate it, or maybe they didn't have a great experience with school and they just don't want to go through another formal training program. And then the final concern is that I think it sets the workforce up to be co-opted. What do I mean by that? Well, if the thing that makes you, you know, sort of a billable, you know, fundable community health worker is your training, then every suburban nurse in America is going to take that two week community health worker training so they can get the CHLB behind their name and start to bill for it. Is that really what we want? Is that who we are, you know, as this workforce? Um, I think that that is a really tragic thing that could happen. And I, we're seeing it happen already in states where um, there is Medicaid funding and it's tied to training and certification. Uh, the workforce is changing right under our nose and it's no longer the trustworthy people who come from communities they serve. On the flip side, if we have a program standards approach, um, not only are we improving quality, we're creating you know, guardrails that make it better for you all to do the work. You know, You have that um, professional identity, again, the compensation, the career ladder, the, the meaningful work practice, and then the supportive supervision. So um, 
let me pause there and just see, does Ashley have anything to add to this? And then we'll wrap up. No, I'm good. I don't have anything to add. Um, it was just um, nice being here with you all virtually. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I'll just close and say that, um, you know, I think that we are all pretty well aware that in America, where you live uh, really determines how well and how long you live. And, you know, this is the map of life expectancy in America, and it's a mess. It's a picture of inefficiency and inequity. And um, we believe that community health workers are going to change that map. And over the next few decades, we're going to look back and talk about we've remade the American health workforce and it reflects the people that we serve. Um, you know, the communities that uh, folks like Ashley are from, they're not vulnerable populations. Uh, they are the resilient populations. And people like Ashley, I think, are the best among us and people like all of you in the room today. And so I just want to say thank you for doing this work. Um, we're at a really critical time and hopefully we can collectively advocate for the right policies and right programs so that you all can um, just change the map of health in our country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley and Dr. Hangovi. Your timing and your content was so critical for our conference as we are on the cusp of gathering uh, people in Vermont to start discussing what model will work for us for training and certification and, uh, and creating a sustainable workforce. So thank you so much. We will be in touch. Terrific, that sounds great. And I'll just say one last thing, which is that uh, there are other community health worker associations across the country, uh, Tennessee comes to mind, where the Community Health Worker Association is playing a role in developing the program standards and actually becoming the accreditor for the program standards. So might be something interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Good luck to all of you. Thank you again. Thank you again. All right. So we are at a prime time in our program where we are going to invite you to go to one of two breakout groups. And this was a perfect, I think, uh, entree to both sessions uh, that are coming up. Um, you've probably seen on your agenda that there will be a session in this room with Ben Culver and Amber, uh, excuse me, Ben Hummel. <laughs> Haven't done that one yet. Oh boy, sorry. Ben Hummel. And Amber Culver, sorry about that, folks, uh, to discuss the power of community health workers, not only in telling their stories, but these two have worked in all aspects of network development uh, in Maine and in New Hampshire. And they will be able to discuss with you what, how they develop their training certification programs and what their processes currently are. They will be in here, and we assume that most community health workers will want to stay in this room for that session. You are also, the rest of you and any community health workers who choose are invited to go into the adjoining room next to us and have a separate session on financing, sustainable financing mechanisms with Carl Rush and Tara Murphy, who is here with us. So before I do that, uh, before you do that, actually we'll do the introductions uh, after you move uh, to the other room. So please pick your session, move expeditiously if you would, uh, because we are just a few minutes behind time and you will be in that other room, those that go in the other room for one hour, approximately one hour, and then see you back here. Thank you.
wanted the ch flourless chocolate tort and uh, ready to go here. So welcome. Welcome to the power of community health workers. Again, the power, training professional identity and owning and sharing our experience. We have two terrific guests uh, with us today, as I mentioned earlier. Ben Hummel is an ally who's collaborated with community health workers across Maine for close to a decade. As I mentioned too, he has worked as a program manager at the Maine Mobile Health Program, a federally qualified health center where he supervised a team of promotores and community health workers that provided health services to migrant and seasonal farm workers. He's been an active member of the Maine CHW initiative since um, for quite a while since it formed and in 2014. He serves as a convener for the Maine CHW initiative. I'm going through this intro fairly quickly so you know. Uh, ben works as a contracted staff person with Maine's Public Health Department, and he seeks to promote and strengthen the CHW role within the chronic disease prevention program through community partnerships. Amber Culver, come on up, you two, please. Come up. Sorry. No. Amber Culver is a CHW and program manager at the North Country Health Consortium in Littleton, New Hampshire six years experience helping her community members to overcome barriers and access services. As a CHW program manager, she uses her experience to now support a team of CHWs in Coos, Carroll, and Northern Grafton counties in New York, in New York, in New Hampshire, working with clients who have uh, unmanaged chronic conditions. Uh, Amber is also a CHW training instructor and has collaborated with CHWs and stakeholders throughout New Hampshire to help grow the CHW workforce and work towards certification for CHWs in New Hampshire. She's currently co-chair of the New Hampshire CHW Coalition, representing the northern section of New Hampshire, and is a member of the board of directors for the National Association of CHWs. I also wanted to mention that I didn't. Ben is also a new board member of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Welcome. We are in great company, have much to learn, and are looking forward to, the, to this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, if you can go ahead and put us on the next slide. Um, so welcome to our session on the power of community health workers. We're going to talk about community health worker training. Um, we're going to talk about professional identity. And we're also going to talk about owning and sharing our own expertise. Um, so Katina did a wonderful job introducing us. Um, so I won't make you go through that again, although I will say I'm sorry to let you down. Uh, Katina has made us, you've treated us like a celebrity, and I so appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry to let you down. It's just Amber and Ben here. Um, <laughs> so, oh, so appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so on the next slide, you'll see just uh, we wanted to make sure that we included just a brief funding statement. I will not read that to you, um, but we are mostly funded through uh, CDC and um, some other federal and state funds, both from the state of Maine and New Hampshire. So on the next slide, there are no conflicts for us to disclose as we begin this presentation. Um, and I'm going to hand you off to Ben, who's going to start us off um, with the history of CHW trainings in Maine. Yeah, thanks, Amber, and thanks, Katina, for um, inviting us to take part uh, in um, this summit, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so I'll get us started today talking a little bit about uh, the history of CHW trainings in Maine, and then I'll be switching off to Amber, and she'll do the same for uh, New Hampshire. So um, when the first uh, kind of established um, CHW programs began in the state of Maine in the early 2000s, um, really at that... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, if you could advance the slide, that'd be great. One more. Thank you. Um, so when the first CHW programs um, were established or starting in the state of Maine um, about 20, 25 years ago, at that point in time, really most um, employers in the state were doing kind of their own training programs. There wasn't really a standardized curriculum probably for the first you know, 10 years or so that um, CHW programs were in our state. 
Um, and a big kind of milestone in Maine was in 2013, Maine CDC received um, a pretty significant federal grant called the State Innovation Model. And there's a number of other states around the country that also received that funding. And part of that grant uh, went to um, funding a, a workforce development initiative that was focused on promoting the CHW workforce in Maine. So um, one of the first uh, components of that project was um, forming a stakeholder group that was made up of CHWs and employers and public health professionals and educational partners. And they worked to try to create some shared language around the profession in our state. So they created uh, the first definition that we had. Um, they looked at roles. And what's most pertinent to this presentation today is that they um, developed some of the first or the first set of core competencies uh, that we had in the state. They looked at the competencies that were in use in other states around the country. Uh, and then they created a framework that was fleshed out and kind of best suited to our workforce in our state. Um, and then after that, um, Maine CDC used that um, set of core competencies and partnered with an organization called the Institute for Public Health Innovation. They're based out of Virginia, and they created a curriculum that was based around teaching um, on those core competencies. Um, they also partnered to provide a training to a group of local trainers that could be deployed to deliver that training around the state of Maine. And between 2016 and 2019, uh, that training was being offered uh, pretty frequently um, several times a year throughout the state. Uh, it was an in-person training. It was about 45 hours in length and usually offered over six full days. Um, but the pandemic in 2020 really put a halt to uh, some of those training activities. Um, that training in the past was offered almost entirely in person, and the lead organization at that time didn't really have uh, funding available to try to revamp that curriculum to a, you know, a virtual setting. Um, and it was right at the time when the state was increasingly engaging with CHW programs um, around COVID response. Uh, to do um, vaccine access work, to provide um, social supports to families and individuals that had been affected um, by the pandemic. So there's really a huge need for training at that time and kind of a, a big hole in our capacity to meet those training needs. Um, we can advance to the next slide. Um, so in uh, 2020, a, uh, one of the partners um, from the SIM project, MCD Global Health, uh, engaged that original group of trainers uh, from Maine and kind of got their blessing to move forward with developing a new core competency training that was could be offered in a virtual setting or format. So um, they had a past experience doing e-learning programs for CHWs, uh, mainly in international settings uh, around the world. And they engaged a group of CHW leaders in Maine and also from other states around the country, like New Mexico and, and Chicago, or Illinois, I should say. Um, and they um, wanted to make sure that the new training that they were developing was um, aligned with the competencies that have been defined by the uh, CHW Core Consensus Project, or the C3 Project, which I believe are also the uh, competencies that have been endorsed in um, New Hampshire and Vermont as well. Um, and they ended up uh, developing um, a kind of a mixed hybrid training that would be offered entirely virtually, um, but would combine self-paced modules uh, that CHWs could complete on their own time, and then that would be reinforced by interactive sessions each week done over Zoom, where um, CHWs would be doing discussions, activities, role playing with one another to reinforce the skills and, and competencies that they've been introduced to through the modules. So that was piloted uh, several times in 2021 with CHWs from Maine and other states um, around the country. And um, the following year, MCD began to offer the finalized uh, training um, consistently. And they're also moving further at this point, they've received a pretty significant grant from HRSA, and they're looking to develop our state's first um, apprenticeship program for CHWs, which would go past the core skills and also provide training and on-the-job experience in kind of other topic areas um, as well. So that's something that's in the works. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, 
So the some of the takeaways I think that we learned through the development of training in the state of Maine, uh, one of which was um, the importance of being able to update your curriculum regularly. Um, when um, that curriculum was developed by IPHI for Maine, it was copyrighted and it was somewhat cumbersome to kind of get funding to be able to do regular updates. Um, so I think that was something that we realized right away that uh, we want training to be responsive to CHW needs, but you need the ability to be able to update curriculum as topics change or as there's more need for training on specific skills or, or health topics. Um, another piece was limitations of um, offering training just with grants. Um, you know, there's uh, talk about sustainability for CHW positions, um, which is a huge issue, but you also have to think about if um, your uh, training programs are only based on uh, grants. Uh, when those grants end, what happens to uh, the you know training programs? Will they be able to continue to operate? Will they be able to continue to meet the training needs um, that are in state? Um, other things that I think we learned along the way, the need to invest in um, trainers, especially CHW trainers. It was a relatively small group of folks that were trained in that original cohort. And over time, we were learning that we need uh, more capacity for CHW trainers to be able to be deployed and to offer that around the state, um, as well as accessibility issues. Um, you know, on, on, in addition to the challenges that were um, posed by COVID, um, having a six-day uh, in-person uh, full, you know, full-day training, right? Uh, that poses really significant challenges to a lot of CHWs to be able to participate, right? CHWs many times have families; they might have multiple jobs; they might need to travel hours to get to a training location. So, I think we were also realizing over time that our traditional kind of in-person model had limitations there. And then also um, the ways in which technology has really helped to address some of those barriers, but also oppose new barriers at the same time, right? So um, certainly virtual learning has been helpful in um, you know, overcoming transportation barriers or, or some of the time barriers, but you also have to think about do um, CHWs around the state have access to devices where they can log in? Um, do they have um, you know, reliable Wi-Fi? Um, are they going to be logging on uh, in the middle of the day when they are driving to an appointment with a patient? And are they going to be fully engaged in that training environment, right? So um, those are other sorts of issues that we've begun to uncover and think more about. Um, and then just finally, a couple um, kind of other parts of Maine's picture. Um, our uh, public health department has provided some significant funding to do training for CHWs over the years, um, but has yet to move to the point of endorsing a, a standardized curriculum or moving towards trying to create some sort of certification system. Um, and um, the state does also not have legislation that really defines the CHW profession. So there, um, other states around the country have been able to make kind of more progress on those areas. And I think um, the department is starting to recognize that um, those kind of areas will need to be addressed in the future. And there is some work underway at the moment to create an operational framework for engaging CHWs on those questions in the next you know, three to five years. So, um, so that's pretty much my overview of the history of training for CHWs in Maine. And I'll, I'll hand it back to Amber so she can go into New Hampshire. All right, so just when you thought you got through the history lesson, we're going to do it again, but New Hampshire. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. Yes, here we go. All right, so for those of you who sat through our roundtable at table 10, um, I apologize that some of this is repeat information, but I promise you'll hear new stuff at some point. Um, so in the state of New Hampshire, there are two primary training organizations. So we have the Northern New Hampshire Area Health Education Center, which lives within the organization that I work for, the North Country Health Consortium. Um, and then there's also the Southern New Hampshire Area Health Education Center. Um, and so the two organizations, we provide CHW training um, kind of collaboratively. They are two separate trainings. They are both set up slightly differently and do cover slightly different content. Um, but we are currently working together on a large project um, that allows us to provide um, a lot of training for free to community health workers in the state of New Hampshire. Um, so those are the two primary. Some organizations do community health worker training on their own, um, but it's not kind of your, your full um, foundational training. 
Um, so in 2000, our CHW training story starts in 2009, kind of. So we had a CHW curriculum um, TA session, series, whatnot, um, from actually the Central Massachusetts AHEC. Um, and then from 2009 to 2012, training kind of went by the wayside. It just kind of sat there, but we held some pilot programs for community health workers. Organizations were seeing, well, we talked about training, but what does it actually look like in practice? Let's, is that this? Um, let's put some CHWs just into practice. And so they did that for a few years. Um, but then in 2013, the Southern New Hampshire AHEC um, held their first CHW training. And that went well, but it took the Northern part, my organization, three more years um, for us to host our first. I feel like there's a weird feedback, is there? Yeah, I don't know what it is. What was that? Oh, maybe it's, got it. Well, so I apologize guys, but. <laughs> um, and so we held our first uh, CHW training in 2016. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that went um, later on when we talk about the delivery of CHW training. Um, but from 2016 to 2020, we held um, both training centers, held regular CHW trainings consistently. Um, in person, uh, I think the Southern AHEC is around 60 hours and the Northern AHEC is around 80 hours. And both of them were running what we thought very smoothly. Um, so next slide. So as we all know, we got the pandemic pause. Um, everything kind of stopped. So both of our training centers um, had to pivot very quickly. I know we were two sessions into a CHW training and had to stop. Um, and that we didn't really know what to do with that. Um, but that happened in March of 2020. And by that fall, we had been able to take our training, our in-person training and kind of flip it on its head and make it virtual. It wasn't perfect. Um, we had put just enough thought into what that would look like to get it going. Um, but we had a lot of lessons to learn out of, out of that. Um, so since then, all of our trainings in New Hampshire have been, uh, have continued to be held virtually. Um, as Ben had mentioned in the main history, we also follow the standard C3 core competencies. Um, so really kind of the same content uh, that Maine is using, and then also what Vermont is working on. Um, so some lesson learned out of our CHW trainings. Um, is that we found that the virtual training really increased our access um, in Vermont's the same way, right? In Northern New Hampshire, we're so isolated. It's so hard for people to get to us. Anyone who is familiar with Northern New Hampshire knows that we are separated from the rest of the state by a notch. I don't know whose phone it is, but it's fine. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's not mine, but you're getting a phone call. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if you're, if you're familiar with, with our area of the state, we're very isolated by geography. There's a notch that separates us from the southern part of our state. There's woods that separate us from everywhere else in the state. And if, if you wanted to come to one of our events, it was you had to travel quite a distance to get to us. Um, so by switching to the virtual world, it really allowed us to reach more people. Um, so we were all of a sudden able to train community health workers in Southern New Hampshire, in Vermont, in Massachusetts. And so that was actually a really huge bonus for us. Um, we did find a lot of barriers with connectivity and technology skills. Um, I think even in 2022, getting ready to head into 23, we still see that not everybody is as Zoom friendly as, <laughs> as we might um, think that they would be. Um, and so we're still finding a lot of um, barriers with that, but we continue to try to figure out, can we um, provide technology to people to join our CHW trainings? Um, we have started holding kind of like a, a ground zero class where you can come and learn the basics of Zoom and how to connect with us and how to join class every week um, if that is 
something that you're not familiar with doing. Um, we found a huge struggle in our peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, community health workers, we connect with people. And when you are learning in a virtual world, that face-to-face, -face, that physical connection is lacking. And so we had to set a lot of guidelines at the beginning of our class um, around how can we make this work? And as a team, because that's what we are, we're in a classroom together, we're a team, we're a community. Um, so we had to say like, listen, I know we're all like tired of Zoom and some days we're in our pajamas and that's fine, I am most of the time. Um, but like, turn your camera on, let me see your face. I can connect with you better if I can see your face rather than a black box with your name in it. And it's okay to turn it off if you need to, we get it, um, life happens. I have had Zoom meetings where my husband was practicing his golf swing and the top of his golf club was visible in my camera. I get it, sometimes we need to have our cameras off, but also we need to see each other's faces, hear each other's voices. Um, and you know, kind of an example I always give when I think about that is we had a participant who was really struggling in the class um, not turning in assignments, uh, never came off of mute and spoke to us, never turned her camera on, and we knew nothing about her. And we got to class seven, and she sent an email. So we had nine classes. The ninth class is our final. Um, and so we do a, an interview and a test and all this stuff. And on class seven, she said, I'm not going to be able to make it to the interview. I appreciate the time that you've put in, and thanks. So. I set up a private Zoom with her and she had her camera on. And I felt such a different connection with her just being able to see her face. And she ended up coming back and completing the class. Um, but we had no idea that she had family struggles going on. We had no idea um, that this environment wasn't the best for her, that she had not been able to get the time off from work to participate in the class. And we never knew any of that because we could never make that connection with her. She was always just a black box with a name on it. Um, and it just makes such a difference. It makes such a difference once you can finally see people's faces. So that was a really huge barrier for us switching over um, to virtual. And then lastly, <laughs> engagement is hard. Um, we all know how hard it is to stay. I appreciate that you guys are all with us in the after lunch session um, because it is hard to stay <laughs> engaged after lunch, even more so when it's on a computer screen. Um, so we really, really struggled um, with keeping people engaged um, and connected. So we've had to do a lot of work around that, making it very interactive. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. Just, I don't know how to make that go away. It's like a weird you know, ringing. Um, okay, so what is CHW training? Is it like disruptive? It just stopped. Is that better, Get No? Is it better? Yeah. I should be leaning into the mic more? Okay. All right. <laughs> so what does CHW training mean for me? Um, so I kind of broke it down into two buckets uh, to start with. So there's building our identity, and then there's, you know, showing our value. So under building our identity, having a standardized scope of practice. So if we have a standardized community health worker training throughout the state, throughout the region, um, and then I go through a CHW training, and you go through a CHW training, and you go through a CHW training, we all know what our scope of practice is for the most part, with the exception of there might be some variances between organizations that you work at. But we all know that we all learned the same thing. We all should have the same basic skill set. Um, and that is easily tracked. We all have the same base set of skills. Um, and so that can really help you build your identity um, when you're like creating a community of community health workers, I guess, right? We all know the same thing. We all learn the same thing. We all have the same skill set. Um, and then there's a common understanding amongst not just the CHWs, but also our stakeholders. If a stakeholder knows, that a community health worker who's applied for a position at their organization has gone through a CHW training, they're going to know what they can expect as far as what you can bring to the table. 
what skills you will have. And so that streamlines right into building up our value. And so CHW training can set employer expectations. Like I said, if you go through a CHW training and that's on your resume or they send you to it once you've been hired, they know what the skills are that you're gonna bring to the table. Um, they'll know what you can provide for their patient or client base. And it can also improve our skill sets. I think a lot of the times we all have some sort of communication skills, right? Um, we all have some general understanding of ethics and boundaries. Um, but going through a community health worker training with other people who are doing the same thing as you really improves those skills. We always tell people at the beginning of our training, we're not here to teach you rocket science. We're not going to teach you any terms that you don't already know. We're just going to teach you how to better understand them and how to elevate them. Um, a community health worker is usually someone who has been a community health worker their whole life. It's in your heart. It's just who you are. So we're not teaching you something brand new. We're just bringing out what's already in you. Um, so now we're going to talk about training and sustainability. So next slide. Yeah, so we also um, wanted to try to uh, connect uh, the importance of training to um, sustainability. And uh, sustainability is a term that, you know, gets used a lot um, when we talk about workforce development. There's a whole uh, separate session right now that's going on about sustainability. But, um, you know, I think one way that we can think about it is, um, you know, when CHW positions are not tied to kind of short term or one funding source, um, which means um, that, you know, when that um, funding or that grant ends, right, the CHW position ends. So, you know, usually the way we think about making CHW positions more sustainable would be through a couple different ways, right? One of them might be through um, payers, whether that's um, insurance or Medicaid, um, actually reimbursing for CHW services. But another very important component would be employers, rather than thinking about CHW tied to one grant, actually thinking about the CHW being part of the overall organizational budget or cost, right? And that the CHWs bring value to the organization and therefore should be sustained in the long term from many different funding sources and are just a cost of operating in general. Um, so you'd have very source, um, uh, different sources there supporting that position. So that's one way to think about sustainability. And the reason that training can be important for that component is that, um, you know, the two big players in that equation are both payers, so Medicaid and insurance and employers. And oftentimes they have the expectation that CHWs do complete a standardized training. Um, and some of the reasons that they cite, um, you know, might be a clear scope of practice that someone's been trained to do. Uh, the other reason might be they feel like that would provide um, evidence that there's kind of consistency or reliable uh, qualifications that uh, CHWs um, provide or have for the work that they do. Um, so um, training can kind of fit into um, the overall sustainability question that way. Um, but I think a couple other key things for um, Vermont to keep in mind is that, um, you know, things like standardized uh, training or certification, they're not really goals in and of themselves, right? Like the goal isn't just to get to certification because that's what everyone does or that's what every state does. Like you have to think about what are you actually trying to accomplish with certification? Is it increasing recognition of your workforce? Is it increasing compensation that CHWs receive? Is it leading to career ladders? Is it helping CHWs practice in new settings, right? So really things like training and certification have to be part of kind of a larger strategy and your larger vision of what you want your workforce to look like. Um, I think another or other things to keep in mind would um, having agreement on what certification um, even means for your state, right? Um, something that Amber and I talk about all the time is that um, CHWs will complete a training program and they will receive a certificate of completion and they will say, well, does that mean I'm certified now? Well, <laughs> kind of depends on who you talk to, kind of depends on what uh, state you're in, right? Many states have additional standards that an individual must meet to become certified. So kind of the important takeaway is that 
um, like all of the stakeholders, especially CHWs, need to be on the same page about what does certification actually mean. And CHWs need to have a say in what that looks like and what's actually appropriate for their profession. Um, you know, there's been a lot of models tried in other states around the country, both around training and um, and uh, a certification. So it's worth it looking at what other states have done, uh, both the good and the bad. Um, there's a lot of great, um, you know, CHW and ally kind of advocates around the country that have worked on certification issues. And many of them are very honest about <laughs> mistakes that have been made or things that have not worked well or ways that they've tried to overcome you know, barriers, um, both for new and experienced CHWs. So um, there's a lot of collective wisdom that's out there and Nachua is doing a great job of trying to bring together many of those voices around the country so they can be shared learning. Um, and then the final piece too is also understanding that workforce development is not really a linear process. There's not a cookie cutter model to approaching these uh, sorts of issues. Um, when I began this work, I kind of had a pretty simplistic understanding of first you get uh, standardized training, then you get certification, then you get Medicaid reimbursement, right? And that's really just not borne out. Like many different states have tried different models there. And even in Vermont, um, there has been work on um, having um, payment for CHW services through um, Medicaid. Uh, there's been some experimentation with that without having a certification system in place. So, you know, I think it's important to realize that there's um, there's kind of no set formula for how you approach these um, issues. So uh, we can move to the next slide. In terms of, uh, we'll, we'll talk now about the delivery and the development of um, CHW training. So, um, this might go without saying, but probably that one of the most important takeaways is that uh, CHW leadership and involvement in um, the development of training is absolutely crucial. And that can happen in many different ways. There's some examples um, up here on this slide, but um, you know what has been tried by um, MCD, who developed the training in our state and what has been done in other states around the country is forming advisory groups that's made up of CHW leaders that actually steer the development of training. Um, it's also surveying the workforce to see what their training needs are. Um, MCD actually conducted a survey of over 500 CHWs around the entire country on their training needs to try to get input for the curriculum that they were designing. Um, and it's also making sure that um, CHWs have a say in workforce decisions uh, in, in, around things like training and, um, and certification. And the way that that has worked in um, both New Hampshire and Vermont is that um, we held votes on whether or not the C3 core competency should serve as the foundation for training. And at least 50% of the people that were voting whether or not to approve that needed to be CHWs. So that's, that's one, um, those are a few examples of how uh, we've tried to make sure that CHWs have been involved in the development of, of training. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, there are other partners that have, um, you know, expertise or resources that they can contribute. So, um, you know, state health departments might have funding for the development of training. Professional organizations are oftentimes really important in being able to center CHW voices and advocate and represent for the needs of the workforce. We also think about employers, right, whether it's a health system or a community-based organization or a social service agency, you know, many of them have um, skills uh, or, or knowledge that they would like to see covered as part of training, um, you know, and also educational partners are obviously important. They're not listed here, but you think about community colleges, um, health edu uh, the area health education uh, centers, um, uh, adult education as being an important players um, as well. But, you know, even though these are all important contributors, once again, having CHW centered in um, the development process is, you know, needs to be held up. So um, I'll turn it back to Amber. Uh, next slide, please. So that's who develops a training. Um, and so now we're going to talk about who delivers a CHW training. And so uh, it's just as important as who, uh, as who develop it, develops it, sorry. Um, so you can have fantastic content and if it's not delivered by the right people it's just going to fall flat um so uh 
prime example of this is my organization. I said that we held our first CHW training in 2016. And I gave you a spoiler and said that we'd talk more about how that went. Um, not good. So <laughs> it had been delivered by two really wonderful uh, people who work at my organization who are CHW allies. They love community health workers. They love the work that we do. Um, but they had never really done anything with community health workers. They just knew about them. Um, and I, I have to mention that a lot of the, if a lot of the work feels parallel between Vermont and New Hampshire, um, the community health worker program at NVRH um, was initially started um, by my former executive director, Nancy Frank, um, who worked at NVRH for a long time. And then she came and she built a community health worker program at the North Country Health Consortium. And now I think she's living her best life in retirement. Um, but we learned a lot um, from her about our CHW training and what community health workers needed from the work that she had started in Vermont. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but these other people who delivered this first training, it was all great content. It was teaching us about communication skills. It was teaching us um, about boundaries and ethics and chronic conditions and all of this fantastic stuff. We had great guest speakers, but it just fell flat. It just didn't connect with the community health workers. Um, I'm one of the community health workers who went through that initial training. And I didn't really feel prepared to go out and do my job as a community health worker. Um, I didn't really know what to do about it at the time, so we just kind of carried on. Um, in 2018, one of those people retired and said, here, I think that you would make a fantastic trainer to one of the other community health workers in my program. So he sat down with the curriculum and he taught a class with a stakeholder. It went marginally better, but I feel like it just kind of identified more problems than anything. So eventually, our community health workers completely took over the CHW curriculum. And so myself, another community health worker, and my supervisor, Annette, who some of you had the pleasure of meeting today, um, we sat down together and we completely redid our curriculum. And we completely rethought how we were going to deliver this content to community health workers. And it's now almost completely taught by community health workers. Annette still makes guest appearances because she can't quite step away. She loves it too much. Um, but other than that, it is taught 100% by our community health workers. And it makes such a difference. So community health workers, we have firsthand experience of the content that we are teaching. We've been there. We've done it. We can tell you stories that relate to it. Um, and I think that's how a lot of us learn. We learn by example. Um, we can read a textbook. Uh, I know the textbook and myself and someone else who's a CHW instructor in the audience, we use the same one. It's, it's a hefty book. Um, it has a lot of great information in it, but it's a lot to sit down and just read. Um, but when you can hear a story told to you by another community health worker who says, hey, no, home visiting safety really is important because one time I did this and it wasn't good, <laughs> right? So we have that firsthand experience. We have a better understanding of how those skills relate to our roles. We can clearly understand how being an effective communicator, how being able to use motivational interviewing correctly and effectively, we know how that relates to our roles as outreach navigators, as care coordinators, as community health workers, whatever our roles may be. And there's that peer-to-peer -peer learning circle. Um, I think oftentimes we learn better from our peers um, as opposed to someone who is in an entirely different role than ourselves. But that's not to say that stakeholders or allies cannot be involved in training. Um, they can still provide very important perspective um, and they still provide a ton of support to the community health worker team that's doing the rest of the training. So both perspectives are important. Um, I really just wanted to take the time to highlight that community health workers should be part of developing the content, but really they should be delivering that content as well. So now we're going to move into the other part of our presentation today. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, please. So this is where we're going to talk about owning our identity. Um, so you can see on the screen, I have four different chunks and one of them is with like a dotted line around it instead of a solid line, because that's not what we're doing today. Um, so first, 
we're going to talk about who are we? Who are we as community health workers? Then we're going to talk about how do we introduce ourselves as community health workers. One of our opening sessions today, we talked a lot about how professional identity is a challenge for community health workers. Um, so hopefully learning who we are, learning how to introduce ourselves, and then talking a little bit about why is telling our story so important. Hopefully this will help us at least a little bit try to tackle that challenge. So um, let's see. Am I ready to go to the next slide? Yeah, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So what's on the screen now is not a mystery to you, but I'm going to read it anyways. A community health worker is a frontline public health professional who is a trusted member of or has a close understanding of the community being served. A CHW uses a person-centered approach to build trusting relationships that enable the CHW to serve as a liaison between health and social services and the community to facilitate access to services and improve the quality and cultural and linguistic competence of service delivery. In addition, a CHW increases self-sufficiency, well-being, and positive health outcomes through a range of activities such as outreach, community education, supportive guidance, self-management coaching, and the provision of social support and advocacy. I will say reading that on an angle tested me, um, but my printed version was too small. <laughs> um, so the reason why I read that out to you is because that's a fantastic definition of community health workers. You all should be familiar with it. Um, but that's a big mouthful if you're going to introduce yourself to somebody, right? And they say, oh, what do you do? You're a community health worker? Yeah, well, uh, a community, you're not going to be able to just sit out and read this, right? So we should all have what we like to call an elevator speech. Um, so before we jump into that part, we're going to talk a little bit about roles and then the competencies and skills of a community health worker. This is all just a refresher for you guys. Um, and then we're going to work on an elevator speech. Uh, so we can uh, go to the next slide. So um, many of you might be um, already familiar with these, and I think we had talked about them, referenced them um, earlier in the presentation. But um, actually, we only have twelve pages. Oh, okay. Just want to go right to the next. Yeah, maybe that would be a good idea. Okay. So all right, let's. Sorry, go. guys. Change in plan. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently, we talked too much, um, and we want you guys to do the activity. So. Um, you see here the roles of a CHW. Next slide. The skills of a community health worker. Spoiler, this is all in your folder on the C3 project. So these roles and skills should match that. Um, and so then on the next slide, there's one more. The qualities and attributes of a community health worker. Um, that may not be in your handouts, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> We all know these kind of core qualities. Um, we have a desire to help. We have empathy. We're persistent. We're creative. We have personal strength and courage. We're respectful. We have the ability to self-reflect. So we're going to go to the next slide. And this is where your work is going to begin. Um, so we're going to make an elevator speech. So what you need to know about an elevator speech is it should be short. It should be brief. It should be a high level view of who you are as a community health worker. Or if you're not a community health worker, a high level view of what a community health worker is in your organization. You want this to be your introduction. So you wanna think about who's my audience? Is it a physician? Is it a community member? Is it an employer, a client, someone else? You wanna look at why. What's the why behind I'm a community health worker? What do I do on a typical or non-typical day? We know as community health workers, a typical day is not a typical day. Um, where do I serve my clients or community members? And how do I uniquely impact the clients and community members that I serve? Um, so we're gonna leave this up on the screen, but what I would like you to do is with the people at your table, if you're a large, if you're, if you're a full table split into two groups, um, if you're a small table, feel free to join someone. Um, but at your table, we want you to take a few minutes and go through and come up with an elevator speech. Introduce yourself. Pick your target audience. 
So as a group decide, am I going to talk to clients? Are we going to talk to a physician? Are we going to talk to an employer? And I want you to go through the rest of it. The why, the what, the where, the how. And build your elevator speech. We're going to give you, is 10 minutes too much? So, thank you. So take about 10 minutes or so, if you could keep track of that for us, um, and work together to come up with an elevator speech. And we're going to take a few minutes to uh, share back or um, just kind of talk at the end. Okay, because I'm not going to give this just like the whole room. I have them down all the way right now, uh, but I'll turn them up. I don't have to you know, like, have a moment to make sure the audio is good. I don't need three people to talk about this. to her she's going to go around the room with this and then we may not even use the second one i don't know how they're going to do it i think they both want to comment on the results of this exercise they're not going to use the oh yeah they will one will use the other is that one is that okay okay i was checking so i don't okay
Thank you, I really appreciate it. No, thanks. Come tell me. Well, this is good. Um, so, so, so there is a stop to stop at the right? Um, good. Okay, we have more. Oh, yeah, I know what to do. And I, okay, okay. We can do both. We can both. No, you can, and then I'm going to, somebody else is going to do it. Well, you need it. How about you need it? Okay. okay. Hello. <laughs> what? This this one? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> so All right, guys, you may or may not have been able to finish your speech, and I apologize if you could not. That's okay. You can keep working on it later. So what we're going to do is if you did feel like you came up with a somewhat finished product, um, Ben is going to do a little bit of light exercise um, and run around with a microphone. Um, so and, and Laurel Ruggles on this in this right. part of the back and room. Laura, they're going to split the room. So Ben, you're not going to get that much exercise. Sorry. So <laughs> is there anyone who might be willing to share their right over there? Perfect. In the gray shirt. <laughs> All right, so we have, we help individuals, SPs, navigate through the healthcare system, create long-lasting, trusting relationships, assessing, accessing resources for our participants, promote health and wellness, all while advocating and being a support person. That's fantastic. And that was so nice and short and covered so much. Is there anyone else who wants to share their elevator speech? Short, sweet, simple. Maybe if you didn't finish it and you just got somewhere and there's still some kinks to work out, that's okay. Anyone else feeling brave? Right over there. And the rest of you will be off the hook because we are low on time. So, so full disclosure, I, this is something that I actually do as part of my job. I have about 20 minutes to meet with, with people and I share that time with somebody else. And so I already had one downloaded. Um, but it works well for <laughs> patients and for colleagues or, or anyone else too. And so I, I usually introduce myself. I say I'm a care coordinator. My job is to help people find resources if they need them. Not everyone does. Um, but if you do, I help connect people to resources. So I do th things like connect people to housing, transportation, food, past due bills, past due rent. I do kind of like a brief intro of those things. And then I say, does that make sense to you? If they say yes, I say, great. Uh, is there anything that I can do to help, help you out today? Um, if they say no, then I elaborate a little further, but that's it. Nice. I love the real life example. Sometimes we tell people we help connect them to resources and they're like, well, I don't know, but past due bills, past due rent, past, like those are the things that we can relate to, right? And our clients can relate to. So I love that. Thank you. So if you need help crafting your elevator speech, we just had two people share some great ones, call them. So, <laughs> um, so if you want to take us to the next slide, please. Um, so we have just a couple of key takeaways and then we'll finish up our session. Um, so 
Key takeaway on elevator speeches, it's about practice, right? I know so often some of our elementary, high school, or college uh, teachers would say, practice, practice, practice. Well, it's a thing. Um, the more you use your elevator speech, the more you're going to know what landed okay and what didn't, um, what's quick and efficient and what's not. Learn to adapt your elevator speech. You're going to talk to different people as a community health worker. You might have to advocate for your role to providers. You might be talking to clients. Someday you might be up here talking to other community health workers. Learn to adapt your speech. Keep it short and clear. 40 to 60 seconds is ideal. Could go as long as two and a half minutes-ish, but remember, people are going to lose interest. Um, and be confident. Own who you are as a community health worker. Uh, Ben's going to wrap us up. If we could go to the final slide. Yeah, and just a couple uh, key takeaways um, regarding training and workforce development generally. Um, first one is uh, know who you are as a CHW and own it. Um, it is really, really powerful when CHWs are able to educate um, others about their role and advocate for themselves. Um, I am still amazed by how frequently um, I encounter people out there who still have no idea what a CHW is, um, no, <laughs> no, no concept for it. So um, at this point in time, it's really important that CHWs are still advocating for their profession um, as much as possible. And stakeholders and allies also have a really important role in doing the same and trying to advocate and educate others about what CHWs do to try to provide um, support through things like funding, um, through trying to um, help uh, do leadership development for CHWs, and to help um, form partnerships and open doors for CHWs. Um, we also think about uh, the importance of CHWs being involved in all aspects of training. Uh, we talked a lot about that kind of in our, our formal slides, but really all the way from the planning stage through implementation and evaluation, it's really important to have CHWs involved in every step. And um, once again, uh, training really needs to be tailored to the needs of CHWs. It needs to be adaptive. It needs to change over time. It needs to be really centered on what CHWs say they need to uh, do their jobs. So, um, so that's it. Oh, and yeah, uh, sorry, if you could advance to one last slide. Um, this just has our contact information if anyone wants to reach out. So. Thank you so much, Ben and Amber. What a terrific session. Gives us a lot to think about as we're on the cusp of developing and thinking about training programs and curricula going forward. So we're going to have a 10 minute break. We would ask that you be back exactly in 10 minutes. We're slightly over our time uh, for the final sessions, but 10 minute break, we'll start back at 2.50. It should be 2.40 now. We'll start back at 2.50. So take a stretch break, water break, tea break, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.
All right, everyone. Hello. We are back in the main stretch of our conference. If you have not had your parking uh, ticket validated, Emily in the back table can do that. And also at the front desk of the Capitol Plaza on your way out, they can also do it. Just wanted you to know that. We encourage you to sign, uh, excuse me, to complete your evaluation forms before you go. Please don't go yet. But it would be, I'm just reminding you, it would be helpful for us as we go forward in this work at Southern Vermont AHEC. Um, that would be helpful information for us. If you can't complete it, we can send it out electronically, but we would love to get as many in as possible today. It, so. So it sounds to me from the day, and I missed some of the great conversations in here, but also was privy to some other great ones that and I think you'll agree that the time for the CHW workforce to be advanced in Vermont is now. <laughs> and what we thought we would do in this la almost last part of our conference is ask you to share your thoughts, your reflections about the last session that you were in, the financing sustainability session, or this one on training and building leadership and power with your collective voice, uh, sharing your reflections and your thoughts, uh, maybe highlights of, of that session or anything else that you wanna share uh, as a highlight of the conference. It could also be a question um, or a comment. So anyone like to start? So is everyone in from the financing group? I take it that they're in. I didn't wanna start Okay. Okay. All right. We have to go forward, folks, because we promised. Uh, I do want to announce something, too, before we take those comments, that um, our dear um, supportive friends at Nashua uh, have agreed to meet with community health workers following this conference. From 3.30 to 4, there will be an optional networking session if you want to to speak with each other, go table to table informally. And then from 4, to 4 or 4.15, we're going to meet at Positive Pie, and they are going to join us. And also, our guest presenters will join us. Any of you are welcome to come for some informal conversation, maybe some pizza, um, if you're game for that. So that will be from 4.15 to 5.15 at Positive Pie. Uh, down the street, which is one-tenth of a mile away, about a five-minute or less walk. So we can give you more information on that. Thank you to all our presenters for extending yourselves. So back to the question. Highlights from your last session, questions, uh, comments. It could be from Dr. Uh, Kangobi and Ashley Harris's session as well since lunch. Don't have to limit it to the last session, but... I'm sure you've been thinking hard about many of these interlocking questions in building a CHW program. Anyone, please raise your, please. Can I go? It, I'll just hop on. Could I, you also stand? Yeah. It should work. Can you do it in there because of the, uh, because It's not of, working. Is it, yeah. is it working? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Are you gonna give us the PowerPoints from today too? We have my question. <laughs> I think some of them will be available, if not all. But I will let you know, and I, it's probably as good a time now as any. I was going to thank them at the end. We have had an extraordinary conference. Most of this conference, except for the financing session and the roundtable, has not only been live streamed, it has been recorded. And we want to thank CCTV. Uh, for their Jordan and his super team for the work that it took to make that happen. Jordan, can you stand up or raise your hand? <laughs> so we will get back to you about the slides. I'm sure some of them will be available. We haven't talked with every presenter yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, and I, I want to 
first thank you and the planning group. I think this has been really helpful and super, a lot of great information. Um, very useful. And I'm wondering, just in terms of continuing that and that sharing of some of the resources that have been introduced today, I know on Nashua's site, there's, a, there's resources available, which is great, but I wonder if there's plans for the Vermont group to have something like we have like a base camp, like some online resource depository uh, for things as we go along, including contact information and things like that, um, as well as maybe even a job board. Uh, uh, because I, I thought like that video was great. Um, we were talking before as we recruit for people, we could really use that to talk about what a CHW is. Um, but imagine if uh, there was one link for CHW jobs in Vermont, um, and that would just help spread the word, or people see some of the things you're doing to promote CHWs, and there's an automatic link to go here and find about opportunities. So, it, you know, just one other avenue. Um, so I think anything uh, to share, given what's been done, would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Dina. I'm with the Sharon Health Initiative, um, and I want to echo you that. Thank you very much. It's been awesome. Um, I thought the, the lecture from Dr. Kangovi was really interesting, and it um, really made me rethink the certification. Um, and I wonder if we should pump the brakes a little, and their data seemed to kind of refute uh, certification. So I, I guess I, that was a new knowledge to me, and then just like I know we're kind of barreling forward with getting ourselves set up, but it did give me pause. I will address that when we talk about our alliance in just a minute, if that, if I may. And anyone else can address it as well, but I'll comment on that. Uh, Thomasina Coates, Blueprint Contractor. Hi, Katina. Um, yeah, and thank you. Just really helpful to be here today. Um, thinking of it from the systems level, I think especially after coming from the last session, I, a lot of the head scratching might come from where is DIVA or is the Department of Vermont Health Access slash Medicaid in the conversation so far? And is there a plan already, uh, you know, are you already on the legislative calendar, for example, um, kind of how connected are AHEC and Blueprint in what's coming in the next legislative session? So you don't necessarily have to ask that right now because I know that's a super hard question, but those are the questions I have now, especially after the last session. So thank you. So so can I so can I I don't I don't want to I'm writing out a list may I quickly comment maybe on on some of these so I don't have a long list the floor with is yours res with respect to diva <laughs> uh, I will say that um, the health department is going to be convening some um, trainings on Medicaid 101 uh, that's in your folders uh, and also we are building out. Um, and we are in support of, and we'll be helping with this, building out the names of individuals that we want to be involved, hope that we be invited to those meetings. Um, and uh, that will include uh, DIVA, it will include Blueprint. We have been very closely um, uh, talking with Blueprint folks, managers, community health team leads. Uh, one of our committee members, by the way, is Julie Parker. Is Julie still here? Julie is on our steering committee and is the uh, assistant director of the Blueprint. Uh, so she has been a strong supporter of, of this work. We'll continue to be working with Blueprint. We look forward to it. Um, and those conversations are happening and will continue to happen. With respect to the legislative uh, session, uh, we just had a couple conversate. We invited several legislators to this event. Uh, Representative Goldman came, and we had a conversation about two hours ago about what kinds of support we would need on a state level, both policy and financial. Those conversations are being spurred and will be happening. So you will be asked to be part of them. Uh, and that's all I'm gonna say at this moment. That's, that's the best we can say. They're all starting those conversations. I'm excited to say that. Uh, Andrea, did you want to comment any further on that? I mean, because I... Yeah, okay. 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 Thank you for the question. Um, I also just wanted to say thank you again. Yeah, lots to think about. Um, there is, I think, going to be a really 
healthy and productive discussion around what training can look like for us as CHWs, for folks who are hiring us, to make sure that this is sustainable. Put that word in um, on all levels. Um, as well, um, excited to do a small plug again because there is not an online website for all of the programs that were here, including the ones that we haven't met yet, um, and the folks, and um, access to resources. Ideally, we will have a map that's beautiful. You can click on your county. It will have a list of housing. You know, you, you name it, you can click on it, get there. That is, we, it is, it is a, an idea, and we are getting closer. Currently, we at least have a list of resources at the bottom of the newsletter that does go out monthly, though this month was busy, so mm -hmm. no newsletter this <laughs> past month. However, um, we're working on it and very excited to work with you all to build mm -hmm. on that because we all have resources in our community that maybe we just learned about or it's a person um, and figuring out how to connect others to those so we can share those resources. So thanks. Thank you. Also, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to get it ready for this conference, but we will be developing a simple uh, one to two page direct, not, not one to two, one to two page per organization directory summary of all the CHW programs that we know of in the state so far. Who are your target audiences? How are you funded? What roles are CHWs playing? Most of it will be brief, uh, brief narrative or check boxes. And we would love to share that with all of you. So there also is a directory of the current community health worker programs by area, by county, by town, and so forth. I think that'll be helpful, and that's in the works. Okay. Any other comments, questions, thoughts from your sessions? Are you numb? <laughs> A little tired or numb? Oh. All right. So before I move on then, before we move, oh, some, do you see someone? Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I just have a thought. It's, and then I, I keep reemphasizing that I'm completely new to this field. I've come out of an entire diff entirely different field. I worked in conservation for the first half of my career. And there we, um, you know, I worked, we, we used the word, and I'm, I'm sort of so glad I haven't heard it said here, this top down, bottom up, top down. I often worked a lot in top down, top down. And so I didn't know, even, even in community conservation, I didn't really work in there. And I think something I'm hearing, somebody over there just talked about the certification. And this, um, it, it probably goes without saying, but in, in medicine, there's been, there's often been a very heavy top down structure. And there was one of the talks, there was something about um, the community health workers supervision should be done by community health workers themselves like we talked about lived experience the community health workers as they themselves have lived experience to serve their community the people who are helping supervise them should also have the lived experience of it's just this is going to be as all of this is growing i guess i think it does again go without saying community health workers are going to be the best people to help design the best structure like again without use that that growing it from the people on the ground from the ground up not the bottom up, but from the ground right. up. That's, that's I think, the way. And, and in Vermont, we're fortunate to probably have a state small enough where we can be making sure their voices are front and center as these pieces come together. I, thank you for sharing that. And that has been the approach of our project, by the way, is to grow this work from the ground up, but also include the policymakers, include the insurers, include blueprint leadership. We have to do this work, uh, in my view, in our view, on every level. But critically, community health workers need to be leading this work. And that's why we started out at AHEC on February 15th calling up community health workers and saying, can we meet with you? Can we talk with you about what you're doing specifically? Who are you serving? What are you doing learning about you beyond what is in a survey? Really digging in further, digging in deeper about that. So thank you for that. And that's a beautiful entree to the next part. And what I would like, it's, this is in your folder, but you please, you don't need to go into it right now. And I mentioned it earlier. Many of you in this room are aware that 
our um, work is designed, well, our work is designed to enhance the community health worker workforce through the voices of community health workers. In fact, a network by definition has 50% or more CHWs uh, steering community development, uh, excuse me, steering uh, CHW training, credentialing, and financing all the work. We endorse that position. That is Nashua's position. It is also our approach in this project. So to that end, our, through our regional meetings that many of you were there in October and November, we have proposed a Vermont CHW Workforce Alliance. Call it what you want, a coalition, but we're calling it an alliance. And it is a multi-stakeholder, will be, it's in formation now, but we have over 15 organizations that, would, that said they're committed to it. It is a multi-stakeholder organization to provide guidance and recommendations on the CHW Workforce Project, looking at training efforts, credentialing, all these pieces that we're talking about today. Do we want to have a training, individual training programs of CHW, or do we want program standards developed and then have certain organizations, entities, or CHW groups offer those trainings? Those questions have not been determined, answered in Vermont. AHEC is not going to answer them. We want you to answer them as, as through consensus and through bringing you together. So this coalition, it's again, it's in your, in your uh, folders here. We're going to provide once we meet, uh, which the first meeting will be in January sometime, recommendations to the Vermont CHW Steering Committee and other interested parties on the training and promotion of community health workers. That group could morph over time into a larger coalition, maybe one like New Hampshire has or Maine, and it will expand and look at uh, credentialing questions and look at more sustainable uh, policies on a state level, like legislative policies uh, or regulations that some states have. Are we going to go towards regulation? I have no idea. I hope not, but it might be one route that we go in for standardization of the profession and to raise it. So I want you to know this is an open book for us, and we have such a unique opportunity in Vermont to move this work forward, learn from our neighbors and our partners, learn from you and each other, of, and define what we need to move forward. So cheers uh, to those that have volunteered to be on the CHW Workforce Alliance, and we will be in touch with you. Um, and we will be in touch with you and hope to meet uh, in, uh, in January. The other thing I want to say about that is it is a self-governing, independent entity. It's going to be inclusive. Uh, we'll have people from one person at least uh, from academics like CCV on it. We will have people that have volunteered from FQHCs, hospitals, but over 50% will be CHWs. So the intent is to have this member-led, CHW member-led coalition. How is that? <laughs> so could we go to the next slide, please, Jordan? Any comments, by the way, any comments about that? Was that clear as mud? But really, I mean, we don't, I'm not up here to say that we have the answers to determine what the model is going to look like in Vermont. It's going to be all of us and to figure out where CHWs are needed. Maybe they're in settings that they're, they've never been in before, but they want to be. We're getting those inquiries all the time from different organizations. We think we want to hire CHWs to do X, Y, and Z. Can you talk to us about that? So that's very exciting to all of us at AHEC as we do this work. So I just wanted to, I have a couple of summary slides and then we will close um, in a few minutes. And I hope this is a helpful schematic to you. The C Vermont Community Health Workforce Alliance in collaboration with the state CHW steering committee and key stakeholders, other key stakeholders, will identify and pilot a statewide competency-based training program to strengthen the CHW workforce as a means of improving health and advancing health equity. 
These are six different levels of work. And as Ben Hummel described earlier in Amber, that's developing this work is not a linear process. We hope that all of these will be happening at the same time in diff with different intensity. Our project as the Vermont Workforce uh, in Initiative, we will start with this alliance to look at the core competency trainings. That's what the work of that, of that alliance is going to do. And what does that mean? Let's review and confirm our definition our core competencies that the state has already, our state steering committee has already uh, determined. Reviewing those and figuring out what is a core competency training that would work for Vermont CHWs, both in medical and non-medical settings. And that I didn't mention that either. On the alliance, in the alliance, it's not only medical and healthcare people, it's others, uh, other CHWs and their organizations from communities. So the numbers really, for this slide don't mean anything significant. So just to show you the different levels. Then at some point, we'll be addressing advanced training for CHWs. We know that in Vermont, many of you have said we need trainings in addictions. We need specialty training in chronic disease. We need trauma-informed trainings, right? This, these are sounding familiar, substance use training. We need specialty trainings. What do those look like? you will help identify those because you are the closest ones to the people that you serve. So advanced CHW training is another level of training that we hope uh, that this uh, committee will, this coalition will address. Opportunities for proficiency assessment and credentialing. What, do that, what does that look like? We've talked a little bit about that. I'm not going to go through it. We don't know yet what it looks like. It could be a certificate of completion. It could be a program with program standards. Uh, it could be uh, a, uh, a credential that the state, some state entity approves. It could be, again, a program-based uh, uh, credentialing process. We don't know what that looks like. But we do know, as Tara Murphy and I were talking last night, this is a key foundational, was her word, component of making CHW workforce sustainable. That that is key, some kind of a credential. Finally, supervisor training. We have set aside money uh, in our grant, thanks to the uh, health department's support. We have, but we have set aside, deliberately set aside funding to train supervisors and organizations, three to four cohorts of supervisors uh, next spring or summer. We don't know when that will be uh, for all the reasons we've talked about earlier, how important it is for organizations to be ready for CHWs, how to supervise, and so forth. By the way, supervisor, CHW supervisors could be supervi uh, CHWs over time. That could be career advancement for them. So we understand that. That needs to be career advancement and elevating to a supervisor position. That's all work that we need to lay out and discuss. The model of developing a process to advance the cultural and systems change levels needed to effectively integrate and utilize CHWs. Blueprint people, we are working on this. QI people, we are working on this. It will take systems change. It will take systems adaptation to integrate CHWs into our workforces and into our health reform initiatives in the state. And we don't have time to go into that, but we know that that needs that work, and that's a lot of the work that the health department is launching. We will do it in partnership with them uh, to the extent that it, um, that it coincides with developing this, uh, this workforce. And then finally, the sustainability of CHWs. What are the policies? Not only financing, but what other statewide policies do we need to be put in place so that this, um, so that this profession becomes sustainable? So was that helpful to let you see kind of where our priorities are and kind of in steps? Because we can't do all of them at once but they all need, they're all interlocking, but we are starting to launch all of them. And when I say we, I'm not talking just about AHEC, I'm talking about our partners, our stakeholders, uh, others that aren't here today uh, as well. Okay, next slide, please. So what we, does anyone have any comments about that? 
before we go on. Any comments or um, burning questions? Any Anything to offer about that? Does this make sense? Does it, does it make sense about what our next steps are and, and how we're looking at the future over the next year? Okay, good. So what have we learned so far? Check this out. Podiums don't agree with me sometimes. So we've learned a lot so far. I hope you've learned a lot today. But we at Southern Vermont AHEC, in holding over um, meetings with over 200 people from various organizations and people coming up to me and saying, can we talk? We're ready to hire CHWs. We just don't know how to get started yet. Very exciting. Never heard that before. We had no idea when we started this project in the mid-February if we would have five people show up at our regional meetings and 20 people at this conference. We had absolutely no idea. But we, we started to talk to you, and you responded because of the need and because of your interest. So kudos again to everyone in this room. So we have learned that Vermont has strong local and regional enthusiasm for launching a CHW network. That network has begun. The, the launching of it has begun over the last few months, and we intend to continue to work on it with our partners uh, that are in the room and not in the room. SVT AHEC Workforce Development Project, in collaboration with others, is helping build CHW organizational capacity. What you are doing by being here today is building organizational network capacity. It's building capacity for your organization, and it's also building capacity for the network. You may think it's a small step. I consider it a major step. Uh, we have not had before a major in-person conference of community health workers across the state in 14 counties. This is a first. The CHW movement, I call it a movement. It's a movement across the country. If you talk to people from other states and, and those of you that are enthusiastic in Vermont can benefit from grassroots organizational involvement. I think Leah could tell you that when once we talk to two or three or four organizations, they recommend, have you talked to so-and-so in this group that is actually hired, not hired, they have volunteer CHWs who are out working on housing and working on different issues. No, we didn't hear of that local group, that hyper-local group, that very local group that's a town group. No, we hadn't heard about it. Most of you probably haven't either, and that's because they're not yet on the map but all of you now are on our map. There are significant capacity challenges for public health in the healthcare workforce and public health workforce and the social care workforces. We know that shortages of social workers, shortages of nurses, shortages of public health personnel uh, all across the state. CHWs, their work straddles those three types of workforces. They are part of every one of those workforces, health care, public health, and social care. That's, again, what makes you unique and special. And then if you're not a CHW, please partner with CHWs. Very, very critical. And in this work going forward, AHEC is partnering with CHWs to work on training and development. Uh, obviously, the health department and we are supportive of working with CHWs on financing and every other uh, issue that comes before you. Um, reach out uh, and reach out to learn more on how we can be supportive of your programs and even the ideas that are brewing uh, to employ CHWs. Any comments on that? Again, the road ahead. I put you all totally to sleep. Is it lunch? It's lunch. Oh, okay. Okay. And it, <laughs> good. Good. I'm glad. Any comments this side of the room that you want to offer? Burning questions? Oh, no. Thank you. No, I, it's been a joy, a, a labor of love. Uh, enjoy because this has just made my year. So in in closing,
let's go to the next slide, please, and then we'll move into the closing. Um, we talked this morning about what community means and that CHW is to me or the embodiment of the spirit of community and the work that it takes to build that community. It's not automatic, it's not easy, but it is magical, as Dr. Kengovi said. But it's intentionally magical. We have to support this workforce. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King, and when I thought about this about a week ago, it came to my mind as I was working on planning the conference with my colleagues, Leah, was thinking about CHWs and really what's the kernel, the essence of a CHW. And this quote came to mind and I had to look it up for it to be exact because it had been about 10 years since I thought of it. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. CHWs uplift humanity in building community. There is no question the impacts are multitudinal, far-reaching, deep, life-changing. Sometimes we can measure those changes, and sometimes it's more difficult to measure those changes. But you know them through your stories. You know them because of who you are, and you know them every day that you're out there doing this work. So thank you to the CHWs who uplift humanity every day. And that dignity and importance, we want, as facilitators of this project, we want to undertake it with painstaking excellence, so that you are supported in every possible way going forward. So thank you. I would like to remind you now to please complete your written evaluations that are on your table if you have not done so yet. Um, Julie, we were going to ask you and Leah and Nicole had to leave, but if um, we need to collect them, would you please help collect them and put them in the back? You can also put them in a box in, on the table in the way, on the way out. Um, you can also leave them on the centers of the table if, if that's preferable. Uh, community health workers that signed up identified themselves as community health workers or those with similar roles. In the spirit of our valuing the time that you took to be here, knowing you took time, you to have expenses. Uh, we want to thank you in a small way. We have um, you know, gift, gas gift cards uh, for you, for those of you that stayed to the end of the conference. And we appreciate your, um, your time and the expenses you took uh, to be here for this conference. So I just want to say it's been an honor. It's been a privilege. And let's go Vermont and see you soon.